if yeah hi good morning welcome everyone to the um, regularly scheduled meeting of the blue ribbon commission on the future of the bar exam um, we're going to start by taking roll Ezra looked like you were going to do that today yes sir yeah please Joshua Pertola yeah here Susan Bakshian present hi David Boyd uh, present Alex Chan here Charles Dugan. Jeremy Evans. Here. Jackie Gardina. Here. Ryan Harrison. Dr. Henderson. Esther Lynn. Tracy Montez. Here. Judge Reiser. Present. Natalie Rodriguez. Kristen Rosie. Emily Civiletto? Here. Karen Silverman? Here. Mylin Spencer? Here. Amy Williams? Amy Williams? Okay. Thank you. Did I miss anyone? Ezra, um, uh, just want to confirm we have quorum. Did you get Alex Chan? I did get Alex Chan. Yes. Okay, great. And confirm that we have a quorum. And we do have quorum. Okay, great. Um, well, let's begin with uh, public comment. Um, I would like to uh, limit public comment to two minutes per speaker today uh, to the extent that we um, if you could just confirm, Devin, that the written public comment has been distributed um, to the members uh, of this commission prior, um, and then uh, let's go ahead and call for uh, public comment for folks that are on the phone or uh, on Zoom. Confirming that we received 10 uh, written public comments that were distributed to the members, um, and we have one um, uh, person in the audience, uh, Jula Sarkar. You have two minutes. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Julian Sarkar. I represent attorney applicants against the unlawful practices of the State Bar of California and the National Conference of Bar Examiners. I want to thank all of you who have worked so hard to reform our attorney admission system in the name of fairness and equity, even in the face of the NCBE's unlawful participation on this commission. This has required a great deal of integrity and courage on your part. I mean that sincerely. I remember in 2017 that when the State Bar's former, former executive director testified to our Assembly Judiciary Committee that, quote, there's no good answer, unquote, why California's cut score was so high, the State Bar Board of Trustees then brought her into a secret disciplinary meeting after which she resigned. Today, I am here to ask you to make yet another bold request in the name of fairness, equity, and integrity, especially at a time when faith in our legal profession and judiciary is at an all-time low. Specifically, I'm asking you to include a recommendation in your report for the State Bar to immediately end all relations with the NCBE and all use of their exams. After 90 years of the NCBE's diploma privilege attorneys fighting to exclude those of us attorneys who remember our oath to the defenseless and the oppressed, they called us the quote-unquote overcrowded condition of the bar. The NCBE has not made any competence showing after those 90 years that their exam uh, measured attorney competence or protected the public. Instead, they now claim that they will produce a new and completely different exam that state judiciary should purchase, another exam that they will also be exempt from under Wisconsin law. Like the other recommendations that this commission will offer, a proposal to immediately end use of the NCBE's exams would simply be that, a recommendation. That recommendation will likely only have any effect if it is even included in this commission's final report, bearing in mind that a, the Kappa Working Group also unlawfully seated the lobbyists from the NCBE and pr produced a report that made it seem like the Kappa Working Group's members had no unique ideas of their own. And while we in the public applaud the honest insights that you commission members have shared thus far, we also do not control how your recommendations are written and reported to our Supreme Court. 
That task falls to the employees of the state bar who have long profited off their relationship with the NCBE and faulty exam software companies and have never been held accountable for misrepresenting government documents. The only instance of such accountability I've ever seen was when former executive director Elizabeth Parker testified that there's no good answer why California's cut score was so high, which is a rather confusing move when testimony is supposed to be truthful. Again, I thank this commission for all the brave and honest work that you've done so far. Uh, and I ask you to continue to stand up th for the truth so you do not have to tell five generations of attorneys that, quote, there's no good answer, unquote, why the NCB's diploma privilege attorneys were able to maintain the system. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. We have no further public comments. Okay, let's move to um, approval of the June minutes. Um, I'll take local. Joshua Pertua. Um, do we need a motion on the minutes? Oh, I'm sorry. Someone willing to make a motion? I move so to approve the uh, June minutes. I second. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Joshua Pertula? Yes. Susan Bakshian? Yes. David Boyd? Yes. Alex Chan? Yes. Jeremy Evans? Yes. Jackie Gardina? Yes. Tracy Montez? Approved. Judge Reiser? Yes. Emily Civiletto? Yes. Karen Silverman? Yes. Mylynn Spencer? I don't know if I can approve the minutes. I partic I was a um, member of the public at our last meeting, so I was there. So I don't know if I have to, I can approve or if I need to abstain. You are permitted to vote on the minutes. It is your call, um, but you are entirely permitted to do so. Okay, then yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Great, thank you. Um, I don't have any specific chair's remarks today, but I do want to just take a moment and talk a little bit about process, um, what we're hoping to accomplish today, um, and give some uh, context to everybody. So um, we're going to start today um, on the business side discussing the options for consideration. And just again, so everybody understands, we're still focused on the non-exam pathway um, for this meeting. Uh, the options for consideration, Audrey's going to take us through them. We're going to discuss them uh, one at a time, uh, some of the advantages and concerns that folks have around them. Uh, at the end of that session, we are going to take a, a poll where everybody will have the ability to um, vote on their top three options. We're going to do this in order to limit the, um, the options based on um, where we have consensus as a group, and so that we can focus on um, getting towards a recommendation, a motion and a recommendation at our next August meeting. Um, then, um, depending on where that falls, we will turn our attention to out-of-state and foreign attorneys um, and have a discussion. Uh, I believe Amy Nunez is prepared to walk us through um, some different options and, and what occurs now, um, and then we'll pick up with uh, moving towards a recommendation at the August meeting. So just so wanted to give everybody a little bit of context and background. With that, um, let's move to business. Uh, Audrey. Thank you, Josh, and good morning, everyone. Give me one second, I'll share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna take you through options um, that we're considering today for the non-exam pathway. Keeping in mind that all the options I'm presenting, well, they reflect conversations we've had in meeting past, of course, um, but that all the pathway related assessments are designed and graded by the state bar. So that's not mentioned, called out specifically, but this is an overview for all the options. For the options that include supervised practice, supervisors are vetted and trained by the state bar. And then there is already the minimum of six units of experiential training required in law school, regardless of whether or not you're participating in the pathway. So anything that's called out, modified or increased would be for pathway participants only. 
And then of course the attorney's license through a non-exam pathway will also have to meet the other requirements for licensure in the BNP code 6060, including a positive moral character determination. So just to keep in mind as we go through. And please, yes, as I go through each option, I can stop sharing, we can talk about uh, questions, we can have discussion. So option A, law school requirements, basically the a status quo program of legal education, except those experiential units that are already required will be, the, the applicant will take ones that are reflecting CAPA, the skills and abilities from CAPA. They'll take the units that match up with the CAPA requirements. Supervised practice, we've talked about between 750 and 1500 hours post-law school supervised practice. So you'll see that in all these options with supervised practice. And then a summative capstone portfolio at the conclusion of supervised practice hours, which would put licensure somewhere between six and 12 months after graduation because the hours there are so, you know, it's a, it's a large uh, variance between 750 and 1500. Any questions on option A? Um, Audrey, I just want to make a point before we get to um, questions. Uh, folks, it's really important today. Um, There's going to be a lot of repetition in um, some of these options, and, and um, uh, whether that's the law school requirements, supervised practice, uh, et cetera. Um, but what I would like to do is be able to talk about what the advantages are and disadvantages of each of these. Um, and I'm very hopeful that we can hear from everybody in the group. This is really, I think, um, an important meeting to narrow these down. So if there are concerns with this option or things that you like, uh, even though it's gonna be re repeated in option you know, B, C, D, or otherwise, uh, I'd like to uh, try to flush them out as much as possible. Uh, with that, um, let's turn to Jackie. Yeah, I just had, um, I think, two questions that I think are reflected or will be reflected in each of the options. One is the supervised practice. Was there any thought given to um, hours that are earned in a live clinic or other experiential while they're in law school counting towards the total number of hours? Or is it specifically that all supervised practice has to occur post-graduation is, is one question that I had. And then the second question related to supervised practice is, is it assumed that supervised practice occurs under the mentorship or supervision of a California licensed attorney? For your first question, it's all considered post-law school is the way that um, these options have been laid out. So the hours would count post-law school. Um, and we haven't discussed, but I, my sense would be a California licensed attorney. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts. But we have not, I did not flesh that out in the options. Yeah, I mean, that's it. just the, the if you think about the question as it was framed, um, Jackie was asking, the, 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 these options are actually um, staff's uh, best summation of the conversations mm -hmm. that we've had. So when you ask, was it thought of, um, if it wasn't, that's because that sh they didn't hear it voiced in our conversations prior, doesn't mean that it can't be. Um, uh, I would love other people's thoughts. I, I agree with Audrey on both of those. I do believe that based on what we're trying to accomplish, um, uh, it would not make sense to have a non-California attorney as a supervisor. I, I, I don't see the logic in that um, uh, personally. And as far as the hours go, um, yeah, I think we were talking a, a, a post-law school, although um, that's if someone had a um, suggestion or a conversation they wanted to have about a program that was, you know, in third year, as an example, we could do that as a group. Tracy? Um, yes, a uh, question would be, I'm assuming that you would have um, a psychometrician involved in each of these areas. So when it talks about um, different things being developed by the state bar, that includes their testing expert, you know, for example, on this um, option, the summative capstone portfolio, that sort of thing. Would you'd have the involvement of um, a psychometrician? Is that correct? 
So I'm, I'm going to address that, Audrey, and then I'll let you take it. I am of the assumption when we make a recommendation um, in the hopefully in the August meeting, that part of it is going to be a very broad recommendation that um, has the necessity of a psychometrician um, as part of uh, that recommendation. I don't think in the conversations I've heard, and I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, that anybody is not um, trying to find a reliable um, solution. Okay, thank you. And then I just wanted to say that I like this option as well as the other options that include the six units um, of experiential modified to reflect the cap of fields and abilities. Thank you. Okay, um, Susan. Just to follow up on Jackie's point on the uh, hours, there's a big difference between 750 and 1500. And while I support all of the non-exam options, um, I would support a higher number of hours if we can include some in law school hours. And if we are not going to include any law school hours, I would hope we would make a decision to support options with uh, lower requirements of supervision hours. As we've seen a lot of success with the PLL program, I feel confident we could do that and it would be well supported. And to follow up on Tracy's point, I agree, of course, psychometricians will help guide all of this process. And Josh, Josh your point as well there. But I had a particular question when we see things like um, summative assessment. I'm assuming we mean state bar summative assessment there? That it will be, the, the assessment will be turned into the state bar and then assessed. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yes, yes, you got it. Um, Susan, I, I just wanna address one um, comment you made about the um, supervised practice and make sure I'm understanding. Um, where, uh, do you believe that there is a distinction between at what point in law school? Is that supervised in a, in a law school program or is that supervised as uh, working for a, uh, a um, independent firm not associated with the law school, where, where would you draw the line on being able to evaluate those hours? I think we would have to rely on the state bar and psychometricians for a lot of guidance on what would be appropriate, but I do think there's a place for in law school hours to count, particularly if we are gonna require a higher number. I think it might be simpler and it might be preferable to go with a lower number and do post-graduation only for simplicity and for clarity. Uh, but I, I think those things trade off against each other. Uh, Karen? Um, thank you, this has been very clarifying. I guess I had, in, it's sort of a process question. Do we anticipate that we're gonna be asking candidates to sort of register or declare a pathway against which we could start assessing those hours uh, and, and then Correspondingly, is there a time after which, if they haven't completed the hours, um, the program ends? Because I, I think part of my concern with this is that we need, we're gonna need or want to put some regularity in, in what this pathway looks like at the very beginning and at the very end. And so if, I, I don't know that we've addressed that, but that might go to clarifying for the rest of us sort of what the full intention is here. Audrey, you wanna? So I think some of the options would require the law student to declare earlier because there might be, some of the options that they go through them, some of them are, are would require a different um, legal education path, right? So I think in that instance, the person would decide um, at an earlier point um, which pathway they were going to, to choose. Um, something like this option, if they have those six units of experiential that, that match up the requirements, I mean, they could, they could declare or decide at a later time to do supervised practice um, post law school in, instead of the exam, or maybe even do both if they <laughs> wanted to. Um, so I think it really, it depends, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm answering your question, but I think it, it depends on which, where we narrow, when someone might have to decide. Um, Karen's second question, Audrey, is an interesting one that I've been grappling with a little bit uh, personally, which is, you know, what is the what is the maximum time someone could 
take to do this, right? So let, let's say that they are doing a couple of 25 hours a week um, uh -huh. and it takes them three years because of whatever reasoning. Um, is there an outside date that we've ever considered? I, I don't believe we've had that no. in conversation yet, Karen, um, about what that outside date would be. That's a good outstanding question to add. Thank you. Um, just one, just further clarification. I guess what I'm also suggesting is that by the time the bar receives a, a capstone or portfolio for assessment, should the bar be aware of that candidate being on that pathway? I mean, is, is there a process that we're anticipating that sort of marks a beginning and then as we discuss and inquire sort of marks an end uh, it, or, or is this anticipated to be a more um, organic process. I see what you're saying. Well, we would know because we know about the supervisors and the, the supervised practice. So we would be, we would know who was, you know, matched up to, to be in supervised practice. So we would know who would be, we would expect portfolios from. We okay. would have that, that bucket of applicants. Yeah, I mean, I think the thought process um, was that obviously this is going to be a highly regulated process. Um, and so at the time that you attach to a supervisor, um, you would, the, that, that would be needed to be reported to the bar and then um, tracked. Uh, Emily? Um, I just have a couple of, uh, I guess, comments and maybe questions. So as I understand, you know, the, the options that we're going through. So, I, and I think this is great because we want to get out all the, the issues and questions. But right now, if when we select our top three, like I, I might select this one, but I still don't have an idea of what the supervised practice is going to look like, but then we're going to work on that, right? So we're, we're not, I'm not, I don't have to know, is it going to be 750 or 1500 to select option A at this point? Is that right? Like these are still to be worked out. Yeah, I mean that that that's something we're going to be grappling with all the way uh, uh, through the next couple of meetings. I don't know how much detail we're going to be able to get into. I think we're going to um, the way I anticipate uh, is that we'll make a recommendation that'll have a range and that it'll be based on um, what we what 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 can be found to be reliable and that they can get the um, that an uh, applicant would be able to get the training that they needed. Um, and obviously, as, as just to be repetitive, you know, we're making a recommendation to the trustees of the state bar um, and to the Supreme Court, um, and they will then decide on exactly which portion they're interested, if any, and how to move forward. Okay, thanks. Um, my other couple of things, one is that just looking at 750 hours, and again, we can talk about this later, that's, we're really looking, if you worked full time, it would be about four and a half months. And if you, obviously, if you double that, you're working nine months at 1500 hours. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's, that's a, a, a lot. <laughs> I think that 1500 hours is a lot. Um, I, I, I am not a fan also of starting a supervised practice in law school. I think that takes the student's attention away from what they are learning in law school. It also puts a little more pressure on them to make sure that they're getting their hours. And, and it's, it's, I don't know that that is the, I don't, with, based on the amount of instructional minutes that they have to have in law school, I'm, I'm concerned about adding that in, even if it's uh, during the summer, because there's some summer work that they do certainly that might even qualify for this, but to put it under a supervised practice changes the nature of it. So I, that's, I'm just raising that as an issue. So this is, I guess why I'm saying I, I do like option A. Um, if, if we are gonna have a non-exam pathway and I'm still not sold on that, but I know that's not an option <laughs> is to just not have one. But if we are going to have one, um, I do like this option. I would also just say that having a supervised practice orientation where you, the, the applicant and the, um, the supervisor are there either online or something that, that sort of initiates the start of this. I think that the bar holds would be a good idea because it gets everybody on the same page of what the rules are. They can hear it, they sign off on it. Um, I, I know I'm getting into the details, but I do think that that official start to the process is important. So thanks. Um, Emily, I want to address a couple of things that you said. Um, number one, 
a, a, a non-exam pathway um, not to have one at all is an option. I, I, I wanna be very clear, this, this, this group is deciding um, as a commission uh, a recommendation. And if it is the uh, majority of the group believes after having what I believe is a very um, important conversation over a number of months and a number of different um, experts that have come through that this is not right for California, then that's the recommendation that this group will make. So I, I don't want you to leave with that's not an option. That is an option, um, but it's not going to stop us from continuing the conversation to see what the possibilities are. Um, that, that's number one. Number two, um, I appreciate your comments on um, law school. I struggle a little bit with the in-law school also, and maybe because I'm not an educator in, in, in academia, um, I always think of it as building blocks. And I wonder at what stage in law school you have the ability to go through that supervised practice. I think I made a comment is, is, is you know, your third year. But if someone was in their first year trying to do supervised practice or even second, do they have the building blocks that they need at that point to really get the um, experience? Yeah, and just just to follow up on that, Joshua, I, I agree with you. I think maybe like your last semester, maybe there is some room there, but I just didn't want it to kind of go too far into law school. Um, I think there's some some compromisable room there. So thank you very much for both of those clarifications. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Judge. So so that, that's so approaching it from a a practice standpoint as opposed to an academic standpoint. 1500 hours doesn't seem like a lot to me, uh, especially when we're talking about, you know, admission to practice, uh, albeit it's it's a difficult, um, it, it's, it will be difficult to accomplish for a lot of people who have other things going on in their lives uh, other than, um, you know, uh, but uh, to the extent they want to practice law full time, it does require a bit of devotion, dedication. So, so, so my thinking is, and I've been keeping my my mind as open as I can. Uh, apparently, at least the information I've heard is that it takes about seven hundred hours to study for the bar exam, plus or minus. Uh, and so, if you study for the bar exam twice, that would be about fourteen hundred hours. The the cut score in California now is thirteen ninety. And I've, I've heard at least one recommendation that perhaps if we have a number of hours that ought to be utilized in terms of a supervised uh, practice pathway, that perhaps 1,390 sounds like a good number because it's already been adopted in another context by the Supreme Court. So, so to me, uh, nine months isn't a lot of time uh, and, and uh, it's actually a short period of time, and even if someone was doing it half time, you know that would essentially be a year and a half. So, so, so to, to me, you know the uh, the longer uh, breadth of supervised practice uh, is 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 more palatable. Uh, I'm just worried about the sort of you know get it done in a few months and you know work a lot and maybe get it done in four months doesn't seem like a a, a, a proper um, pathway, but that's just my instinct. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thanks, Josh. I, I had um, some similar comments to uh, uh, to Emily, and and I'm thanks for that clarification on that uh, in terms of the ability to um, to not vote for any of the options. So that that was my I needed clarification on that too. So thank you for that. Yeah, and let me address that. We just one um, with a little more detail. We are going to move towards um, uh, the three at this meeting. Everybody's um, three options. We're going to narrow what we think is a possibility as a group, um, but ultimately it it will be a motion. Um, and if people are uncomfortable with that motion, then then they have the ability to vote against it. And if we don't um, get to a majority, it won't move forward. Um, David. Just a, a comment that applies both to this option, but probably to others as well. You know, assuming that a non-exam pathway is a viable licensing model, obviously we, not everyone is going to be successful. And I think it might be important as we talk about these options to think about what is the next step when when an applicant on this pathway is not successful. 
Is it additional supervision? Is it a second assessment by a different group? Is it a rerouting to the exam pathway? Uh, I mean, th there's no more reason to think that, uh, that more people are necessarily going to uh, be successful on this pathway uh, if indeed it's as rigorous as uh, an exam would be. So um, looking ahead, uh, that probably ought to be considered. Um, uh, just address that briefly and, and um, Audrey, please jump in if uh, you see it differently. I was of the assumption as we've discussed these that if for whatever reason you were not successful in the assessment, you would have the ability to go back through um, some piece of supervised practice. And we have to talk, David, about how much, what that would be. Um, and you could go through the assessment again, and frankly, probably as many times as you needed to until you got through it um, successfully. Um, is that, uh, Audrey, were you under the same assumption? I think we did have that conversation at the last meeting. We did talk about, um, in terms of um, pro proving your competency through like a capstone or portfolio, and if that needs to be reassessed and resubmitted, that could be something that happens through this pathway. And then the exam could always be an option if we also have that open. Um, okay, Alex. Thank you, Chair. I just wanna echo my um, agreement with Judge Reiser's position. I, I do think the number of hours for post-law school is too little. In practice these days, uh, most law firms in California, the minimum billable requirement now is at least 1800 hours. And for a lot of the big firms, we're looking at 2000 billable hours alone. And that doesn't even include all the non-billable that an attorney has to bill things like, you know, taking classes on legal writing or, or learning how to take a deposition and things of that nature. And so really when we're looking at 750, that's probably just one third of what a typical junior associate bills at a typical firm. And so I just want to make that clear uh, and, and support uh, Judge Reiser's position that this seems too little in practice. Uh, but also another issue, well, not really an issue, but more of a question. I understand there are different options for each one of these categories. And really, when I look through all six options, you literally could have, you know, more than 10 different permutations and probably a lot more um, you know, looking at all the options for each category. So my question is, how do we arrive at these six options and only these six options and no other options that are available? For example, if, if someone wants to support a, a more stringent, more restricted um, set of option, you know, with, with everything maxing out, for example, that option doesn't appear to be available. So you know, maybe I'm just guessing here that there is an objective, that there's a goal that each option is trying to achieve, and that's how we differentiate. So my question is, how do we arrive at these options, and what objective is this option A trying to achieve that I need to understand? So I can tell you, Alex, since this is <laughs> the deck that I made, uh, it was trying to take all the conversations that we've had. Um, you know, I put together that uh, other variant like that draft framework about all the pieces we've talked about over time and then trying to lay them out um, as, as simply as I could based on all our conversations to say this is what I've heard let's talk about it and and nothing I have put forward as staff is that all put in stone we we, we will discuss and narrow and and reflect um, the feelings of the group of course just trying to take all the input and put it out again to you for discussion. Understood, thank you, Audrey. So please, I mean, and just do what you're doing and, and, and say, this is, I like this component, but I want this to reflect it, you know, the assessment piece to say X and we can, we can talk about all of that as we go through. And ultimately we're going to work towards consensus um, as difficult as that may be, or um, maybe even impossible, but that's, that's what we're gonna work towards. Uh, Alex, I'm going to ask if you don't mind. I know uh, you're very active um, as a, a committee of our examiners and, um, and clearly have your um, ear to the ground. I'm just curious if there's been any conversations around non-exam pathway or any information specifically that you would share with us um, on how CDE sees this. Yeah, yes, Chair. So I have um, conferred and received comments from the full committee of our examiners 
including the chair and vice chair of the committee. The committee is gravely concerned about the non-exam pathway because in its view, this pathway lacks adequate implementation detail and doesn't explain the impact of each option on all the stakeholders. In general, the committee's position is that this pathway is not um, adequate for testing for minimal competence. And, and specifically in light of the increasing number of non-ABA accredited and also non-California uh, accredited as well as non-accredited schools that have received a notice of non-compliance for the failure to meet the state bars rules for accredited and accredited law school rules in recent years. And so in light of all of these concerns, the, the sense that I'm getting from the full committee is that this is not the best option for California. And when you say this is not the best option, you, you are referring to a non-exam pathway of any kind. That's right, yeah. The non-exam pathway is not the best option for California. Um, I'm gonna take the chair's prerogative for one moment here. Um, I, I, I appreciate uh, those comments and I do understand um, that there's a, a, a ton of experience and expertise. I will say I'm somewhat frustrated by um, the number of practitioners that um, look at this and say it's the way it's been done before with an exam pathway and that that's the right way. And I, I just can't accept that. I'm not, I'm not saying that, that a non-exam pathway is a possibility, but I think it's a really healthy and important conversation. The fact that it's been done one way in the past to me does not mean that it's the right way for the future. Um, but uh, I take those comments very seriously. I um, understand them and I hope this, uh, uh, commission will consider them uh, as we make our decisions. Uh, Jackie. Thank you. Yeah, I just um, I don't know how many people had the opportunity to re read the Ontario um, material that was presented to us, but I found their question for consideration on page 36, their concluding points are really helpful framework to think about the options that were, are being presented to us today, as well as any others that we might be thinking about. Um, and so I would encourage people to certainly take a look at that document that was provided to us uh, and specifically at the concluding points, because I think those questions are, are very helpful, at least for me. When I think about these options um, and I think about the conversations that we've had in previous meetings, I see um, the law school requirements, and I would specifically uh, be more supportive of, of a modified program that was reflective of Kappa, because as I understand it, every seven years, we're going to do another analysis to make sure um, that what we're thinking about is entry level competence is consistent. Um, so I would say a modified approach. I think of that as what Dr. Henderson talks about, that need for breath. Students need to have foundational knowledge that goes quite um, broader than what they might get in supervised practice or what they might get in a clinic setting, however we might talk about it. So um, what going to Alex's question about what we're trying to accomplish here, I think of law school requirements as really that breadth of knowledge that CAPA speaks to. Um, I think of supervised practice as that transition to practice uh, so preparing graduates for both the professional, uh, the skills and the knowledge needed in actual practice, and then the assessment as a way for us to determine whether or not between law school and supervised practice, they were able to develop the skills necessary to establish minimal competence. Um, I think that, that there's a way for us to think about this uh, that meets the minimum competence question, I think this is we're missing Dr. Henderson and I know Tracy, you have vast experience in this. I think the biggest question for me is how are we going to establish that summative capstone portfolio as something that's gonna be consistent, reliable and valid across everyone who might uh, choose the non-exam pathway. But I think there is a way to craft this. And again, I turn back to the Ontario um, material, which I found very helpful. Uh, in, in terms of thinking about how to make this, what I think is in some ways maybe even more effective, but we need data to support that because what's missing right now is that transition to practice. It's what the Ontario 
um, articling talks about uh, as transition to practice. Right now, we have students graduating from law school taking a um, timed um, exam that's based on memorization and then moving directly into practice because we call them competent. We don't have a transition to practice, and I think that's a real deficit in our current licensing. And I welcome an opportunity to talk about how we might make licensing stronger in California. Jackie, uh, thank you for bringing up the um, Ontario report. Um, our intent um, is to um, begin the next meeting in August with a presentation on that report um, before we continue our conversation. Hopefully, we can um, get that scheduled. Susan? I just wanted to make a couple of quick points. The, the first of which is I don't think there's any surprise that the Committee of Bar Examiners would not support a non-exam option. Um, but I do think it's important to go back and reflect on everything we have seen so far, which reflects that the psychometricians agree that we absolutely can produce a non-exam path that would be effective. And I agree with Jackie's point that in many ways, I think this would be a better protection for the public, a stronger protection that folks truly licensed are truly ready to be uh, lawyers in California. And I also think it's important not to confuse the issue of whether or not there are some law schools in California, unaccredited schools, that perhaps have, have issues. That's not the goal of this commission, and it's not our job to solve those issues. If there are problems with unregistered schools, then that, then that can be resolved through the registration process and through other components. I don't think this is the tail wagging the dog in my assessment, that we should be focused on when law school graduates from California and ABA approved schools meet these requirements and we create a path that works that that's an excellent public protection and that we should not be making rules worried about a very small or isolated problem if it exists at all. That is not my expertise. But I also think it's important to recognize that we have seen a lot of really good modeling in Oregon, in Ontario, in so many other jurisdictions that suggest a non-exam path is in fact the future. And I've said many times on this commission, I feel it important that California lead and I think an exam only option is backward looking and these non exam pathways we're looking at today are problematic in terms of there's lots of open variables. But one of the things that I believe Neil has suggested to us from the Supreme Court's perspective and I hopefully do not misstate it Neil but what I what I've heard Neil say is we should give as much direction and specificity as we can because it makes it easier for the court to make an assessment of our interpretations and of our recommendations but I think it's important to recognize we won't be able to eliminate every detail and that's not the goal of this commission it's to make recommendations to a proper path forward and I think that we have a lot of good options and ways to do that. Thank you, Tracy. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief because I, I know we've talked a lot about this option, but I'm struggling with a non-exam pathway. I think I said that before. And, and as a psychometrician, yes, this is something that's possible, but it's going to take a lot of time, money, and energy. And, and not that, that those aren't important things, but it becomes, um, an issue of whether or not you can reach standardization, reliability, validity, legal defensibility. Um, more time, more cost, more energy gives you more evidence to support that. And over time, it becomes very hard to continue to meet those elements. And I say that as someone with 30 years of test experience in regulatory agencies, the intent is always good. And I respect what the other states are doing. I certainly agree that that is something in the future, but given the number of candidates that California sees, it could be challenging um, to compare us to some of those other states. So I am being open-minded because I appreciate all the conversation and I am not an attorney, but I like the idea of the supervised hours. I think the comments about the transition are great. Where I look at this um, graph and I see assessment, 
I lean towards an, an exam there that is developed with a psychometrician and the state bar that is much smaller scale. You keep the supervised hours that's going to focus on some application. You look at this assessment piece and you come up with an exam that truly is entry level and not as complicated as maybe what the state bar is utilizing now, really focusing on high level broad concepts and your supervised hours gets more at those um, more detailed things like that. That's, that's kind of you know, where I have been going with this, trying to think about how to incorporate non-exam pathways. So maybe, you know, as we go through these options, think about how that summative is going to be standardized, how it's going to ensure entry-level competence, given the variety of experiences that your candidates would go through. Thank you. Alex. Yeah, Chair, do you foresee any DEI issues with respect to supervised practice and also assessment, particularly for applicants who don't have the resources to engage uh, attorneys or to work at a firm um, to you know, ensure that they can actually get the hours uh, that are specified under this option? Yeah, I mean, we've discussed that um, a little bit as a group. Um, I think that all of these options have some complexity to them. Um, and I think fairness and equity um, uh, is going to be something that's going to have to be mitigated and managed through. Um, I, I don't claim to know all of the perm permutations at this point, but um, absolutely, I think it's something we need to be um, at least considering and, uh, and, and have a, a general understanding of. Um, uh, I know that this has been discussed before. Is there anybody else that wants to comment on that? Because I know it has been discussed and um, especially around supervision and that's what Alex's question is. But, um, uh, Neil, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to you. You put your hand up and Emily, I'm gonna come to you in one moment. Oh, actually, Emily was first. Okay, Emily. <laughs> I'm, I'm, thank you, Neil, I'm fine. Um, I, I, all I wanted to just say is remember that when we're talking about the bar exam of the future of California, we are not talking about the same bar exam that we have had for so long, right? When we talk about transition to practice, what I think we, the work that this commission has done, if we're, if we're talking about our recommendations of the bar exam is gonna be a bar exam that would actually make law schools train <laughs> their students to be able to hit the ground running and, and, and practice in some way, much more so than it does now. We help train them literally how to memorize. We train them literally how to apply rules to facts and do a very short version of issue rule analysis conclusion. That's because that's what's tested. Yes, we do prep them for the performance test. And of course, as a law schools, as all law schools do, we prep them to go be lawyers. But in this process, as we're thinking about this non-exam pathway, and we're thinking, I, I agree, I think it was um, either Jackie or Tracy or both that talked about the important piece of this to me is the assessment. It's number three, which is what does that look like? And then you sort of build back from there. If we're saying you need to have a capstone portfolio to show, what are you gonna show, right? What are you showing to show minimum competence? And then you're gonna build in the hours and the necessary elements of supervised practice, the breadth that's gonna to take to do that to get to this summative capstone portfolio. If that really is showing minimum competence, just the way our new, hopefully new bar exam with all of its components of testing more skills than doctrine, um, then I think it's gonna be on par with each other and I am not necessarily backing away from it. Um, but I do think it's important that we're not talking about this or the current bar exam that we have, right? We are hopefully talking about in our recommendations about a different type of bar exam that would really in, impact the law school and how teaching happens to get more of that transition to practice that I think everybody agrees we need to have. Thank you. Neil? I'm just going to say, I feel like a lot of the struggle that this group is having is because we're sort, of, we're sort of talking about these concepts at an abstract level, and there's like a data vacuum. 
So that was part of the reason why I suggested sending around the Law Society of Ontario report. Uh, the good thing about that report is it's, it was done after doing a survey uh, in the year prior of the articling program in, on, uh, in Ontario. And you'll notice that um, when it comes to DEI issues, there is a highlight there um, expressing concern that roughly about 10% of applicants are unable to find supervisors and that gets exacerbated with, uh, with folks of color. So uh, I, for those of you who have not read that report, I really recommend uh, a, a, at least a surface dive into it. Um, the first part of it goes through the, uh, the results of the study, but um, I think that's an important uh, point to keep in mind because we need, we need to make decisions based on data. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, I just wanted to um, sort of, I best put some context on this in that, you know, ultimately this group or half of this group uh, decided on the, uh, on the other committee, uh, the other subcommittee, if you will, that we would be changing the bar exam. That's what our recommendation would be. We'd be making it more practical, adding in uh, additional things like dispute resolution and negotiation and getting maybe moving away from the uh, memorization piece. And so I think one thing that sort of concerns me is that if we're moving towards um, adjusting the bar exam and changing it from what it was, but then at the same time also providing another pathway, I think um, that raises a few questions. One is, uh, would everybody choose the non-exam pathway? I think that's sort of one, one thought in my mind. I think the second thing is when I've been giving a chance to this idea of what would happen if we change the bar exam. And, and, and I also think that history here in context is important in that um, it was that the exam was three days, now it's two. It was that the cut score was a certain level, now it's lower. So, um, and of course we've since then offered uh, the test um, online and open book. And I think um, whether or not those options are offered in the future is, is maybe still on the table, but. I just wanted to add some color to the to the context here in some of some of my thinking. Thanks, Josh. Audrey, let's um, just move to the next option. A lot of the conversations could be repetitive, um, as sure. Alex pointed out, but it, but I'd like to just move to option B, and then we can con mm -hmm. continue the conversation. Hopefully, as we do that, maybe we'll dig a little deeper into uh, each of the different elements. All right, that sounds great. Um, moving to. Option B. So option B um, should look familiar. So we talked about having a non-exam pathway curriculum during law school with expanded doctrinal and experiential education requirements modified to reflect CAPA. Um, this would be paired with supervised practice and then that summative capstone portfolio and then a similar target range for licensure. So I want to just take a moment and focus on the law school requirement portion. Obviously, that's the difference here um, between option A and option B. And I think we had this conversation a little bit um, last time. And the question becomes, um, are we comfortable with what currently um, the amount of time that currently exists um, during law school um, in experiential uh, reflected in Kappa? Or do we need to do we feel it's necessary to expand that time? Um, that that's the main difference here. Uh, anybody have any thoughts on that? Mylin, a couple thoughts about moving some of the requirements um, into the law school experience. Uh, first one is that six, the current requirement under the ABA standard of six experiential units, which was is built into all of these, is a pretty um, small amount just to give you a sense. I teach an in-house clinic and we award eight units for that. Um, so when we talk about modifying those experiential units or leaving that as the um, the sole requirement, it's not a, a ton of time on the student's part and it's not a lot of their academic program. Um, for example, at Hastings, you need 86 units to graduate. So six um, is, a very, is a pretty small fraction of that. Uh, there was talk 
at option A of whether the supervised practice requirements, some of that could be completed within law school. And this is, I guess, a question. Um, when we talk or during law school, I'd like to differentiate between supervised practice that might count towards the 750 to 1500 hours being completed while in law school and including say a summer job versus uh, being completed within the law school curriculum um, as an experiential requirement through an in-house clinic, a hybrid clinic, or a field placement program. Um, the latter three of which are all supervised by faculty and therefore um, I think would typically lead to greater um, learning on the part of the law student slash candidate for licensure. So if we were saying that those um, that some of the supervised practice could happen within law school, um, if if it's un somehow under the direction of faculty, I think we're going to have high, um, I would definitely support that as a way to reduce the number of um, total number of hours. Uh, required under any supervised practice component. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I see the complexity around this. Um, we will uh, we'll be getting this conversation in a little while, but you would be um, cutting out all out of state schools, more than likely um, ABA or otherwise, uh, when you started adding It'd be more difficult, I think, when you start adding um, additional requirements um, in um, experiential. Um, they would have to figure out how to accommodate that um, if that was the case. Um, uh, that may be one complication for us. Um, I generally, um, that was really helpful, Mylena. I generally uh, thought that the amount was. Uh, maybe needed to be increased personally um, at the law school requirement, but you're also would be forcing students at some point in their um, education journey to make a decision between the two paths. Um, not that they couldn't go uh, uh, go back, but they would have to be making a decision in order to take that expanded experiential education that may otherwise wouldn't be taking. Um, and so those are just a couple of complications that I think of uh, when I think of this. Could, could I just, I'm sorry, um, Alex, I just realized that there, I had one question um, that follows um, closely that about the interaction between this law school requirements component and the very, the, the first slide you showed, Audrey, about um, across the board understandings of the components where you said that the state bar would conduct all assessments. Yeah, so all the way to the left pathway related assessments are designed and graded by the state bar. If any pathway were to start within law school, does that mean that a law student would be um, performing some experiential um, pathway related uh, activity and then it would be sent out to the bar, even though they were a 2L or 3L for assessment by the bar? or would the bar adopt the law school's grade? That's a good question. And I think so that um, the option B that I was just showing is more like the, what the design is happening in, in Oregon, um, where they're going to set out a curricular path and exactly you know what kinds of course meet different unit requirements. And so that would be something I would imagine that we would regulate saying that this is what the curriculum has needs to be in law school and then the post law school assessments we would be um designing and reading those but, but that's just my that's just my thinking based on the presentations from Oregon and again it doesn't mean that there would couldn't be components that are also um checked off or, or filled in from the the law school experiential courses but that was just how I was thinking about it was more like what is the design from the, the Oregon committee. Hey, Audrey, you have a, a little bit of an echo. I don't know if maybe you have a second. Um... I don't, I'm all alone in my house. <laughs> I'm okay. sorry, if it's, it, is everyone hearing that? Are you, um, so we can hear you, you just have an echo. 
I can, I can try, try to, to put, put my, my headphones, headphones in. in. Mylin, did that answer your question? Let me let me because I let me try. I, I think um, I think if I would jump in if I'm misunderstanding. I think that um, what context was not that the state bar would um, grade or uh, look at any assessment during law school. State bar would look at the curriculum um, that would be counted as Kappa experiential and approve the curriculum. Um, on the on the non-exam pathway, and then they would um, be uh, assessing just the ass uh, the assessments after supervised practice. And Josh, if I may, I, I think the one caveat maybe to that would be if there were some portion of this seven hundred and fifty to fifteen hundred hours that were done. So, for example, let's say let's say the commission said. We're going to require 1,250 hours, but up to 500 of them can be done in law school. Um, to the extent that, then I would think that we that the bar would be looking at whatever is sort of deemed sort of the the, the components of the capstone project or the portfolio, um, right? So maybe it's a it's a memo. It's making it's the supervisor signing off on um, that they've done done three client interviews, um, whatever sort of those requirements would be, um, those could be potentially accomplished in those 500 hours that are that are done in law school, in which case the state bar would be looking ultimately, you'll be grading it while they're in law school, but we would be, the state bar would be assessing whether or not it meets the minimum competence requirements. <laughs> Alex? And Donna, I got a question, just to piggyback on what you just said. So what if somehow the third part says, hey, you know, whatever the applicant submitted doesn't pass muster, does that applicant, now that the, the applicant has graduated, does that, does that mean he has to go back to school to get more credits? I mean, because we can't assess that applicant's um, requirement until, you know, he or she graduates from school. Um, well, so so uh, I think the answer the answer is sort of manifold, right? So one is to the extent that that what we are theoretically hypothetically talking about right now are supervised practice hours that are achieved while in law school. If um, if the if the the portfolio um, is not approved, then you could presumably get still get that through additional supervised practice hours outside of law school. Um, but also there was an assumption built into what you said, which is that we would have to review the um, those projects after graduation. And that may not necessarily be true, right? There may be the ability to flow them in um, to the bar, have them reviewed so there is an opportunity to learn and improve and grow, whether we're talking about during law school or, or after law school. Um, you know, there, there, we, I don't think we've settled on whether this is, this is an end of the day after you've completed all the hours you submit it, or if there is the ability to submit and get feedback um, during the, while the hours are being conducted. Thanks, Donna. And then this question is for the chair. Chair, uh, maybe I'm still, uh, I'm, I, I'm not totally understanding. I, I know we're talking about everything in abstract and so there's really nothing concrete, um, but in terms of supervised practice, I'm just looking at the recommendation from the uh, IAELS and the professor from the Ohio State University uh, uh, that they presented last month. And under their recommendation, they recommend these supervisors to be licensed in California, to have a clean disciplinary record, three or more years practicing as a lawyer with at least two of those years here in California and a focus on DEI. Have we sort of considered this recommendation and whether and how many attorneys in California actually fit that criteria? If not, you know, is there maybe some other recommendation that we can look at to truly understand what supervised practice means? Because I do sense that there is some possibility for manipulation and abuse. For example, more than not, more often than not, a, 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 
a professor can oversee 20 different students in a single clinic or a practicing attorney can supervise, you know, seven or eight different junior attorneys. Just because someone, you know, oversees someone doesn't mean supervision or the proper supervision is given. And so I just want to make sure I understand where do we draw the boundary? How do we evaluate and assess, you know, what supervised practice is and means and when is it proper? Audrey, I'm going to let you um, answer that. I know we have some experience um, currently with PLL. I know we've talked about <clears throat> the, uh, and I, I make sure Alex understands that uh, this supervised practice is not um, intended to be the Wild West. The, the bar would have a role uh, in making sure that folks are um, uh, approved um, and overseen. Um, but if you want to give a little more detail, Audrey, that'd be helpful. I think, um, can you hear me any better? Is it any better? Sorry if it's not. It is better? Okay, well, that's great. Um, I think that was part of um, the idea um, about how we would make sure that for all options, supervisors are vetted and trained by the state bar. And as we've heard from the jurisdictions in Canada about the articling programs, not just in Ontario, but all of the jurisdictions, jurisdictions that require articling, which is supervised practice, we have a lot of data and lessons learned about how to ensure um, vetting and um, training of supervisors. You know, we could we could take those lessons from the Canadians and really apply them. And I hear more about them in August too, um, if we have Ontario back to talk about um, their report and what they did um, since 2018. So, um, and, and part of it could be also, Alex, the, um, one of the outstanding questions I have at the end is, is the phase in and how we, how we, if we move forward with one of these options, how we phase it in and, and um, part of that could be, you know, uh, piloting and, and making sure that we're doing the right thing by the, the supervisor vetting and training. So I have a lot of thoughts there, hopefully <laughs> similar to yours in terms of how important that piece is and how we get to um, the right matching, the right people supervising and making sure that um, we're on top of that experience. I, I don't wanna dismiss Alex Alex's comments. I, I, I mean, I don't think we have, but I just wanna lay out how important they are. I, I do believe that if not um, uh, properly, if the supervisors are not properly supervised, uh, we will have an, a, a, a problem um, with folks that are uh, trying to take advantage of the system and those that are um, uh, uh, not doing a good enough job or the job that we expect. And so I think that's going to fall on the bar um, on that training and that regulation um, uh, to make sure that that uh, occurs appropriately and correctly. Um, Susan? Uh, just a couple of quick things. On the supervised practice component, I. I agree there's always a concern for there to be abuse of a, of a system, but I am not particularly concerned about it if we do have proper vetting by the state bar and they vet the supervisors and they are required to be California attorneys. I think California attorneys will be very careful not to vouch for someone on a non-exam pathway when their own license is at stake. And there are ethical obligations that currently exist in California not to further the application of someone you know not to be prepared or appropriate for licensure in California. So I think we have ethical protections and I think we have other protections. And I also think we will have the state bar using a lot of professor merits and other kinds of requirements to ensure a, a proper process there. I do wanna just make one more point about the option A versus B in terms of requirements. Um, I, would for, I would prefer something along the lines of option A with just the in law school requirements being more streamlined for a couple of reasons. One is I do agree with the concern of excluding all out of state schools unnecessarily um, by something like option B might do that depending on its requirements. But I also think that part of the answer to California is a large state and we have to be careful about what we do is yes, we do need to be careful, but some of the ways we could do that would be a streamlined non-exam pathway that requires six existing units without additional in-law school curriculum changes. And that would allow a non-exam pathway to go forward that would be less of a burden on the size of our state.
Jackie. Yeah, I, I want to make sure I understand um, a modified the option B and option A as it relates to law school requirements. And I think it relates back to something that Emily said and the way that I think about um, uh, what this is going to mean for legal education in California moving forward. Emily made a statement that um, the new California bar exam will require law schools and give us an opportunity to actually prepare students better for the practice of law because the exam is going to better reflect legal practice in the state of California. To me, that, that automatically means that we'll be modifying our curriculum because right now, as Emily mentioned, we are teaching to an exam that requires certain skills that don't necessarily reflect the skills necessary for practice or even quite honestly, the knowledge necessary for entry level practice based on the CAPA report. So when we're talking about a modified law school curriculum, I'm assuming that all law schools who want to prepare students, whether it's for the exam or for a potential non-exam pathway, will have to modify their curriculum if Emily's assessment of the new exam uh, is correct. So when we say um, a, a modified law school requirement for non-exam pathway, how is that going to be different than preparing students for the exam? And I, I ask that because if in my mind, we don't start with the law school curriculum. We start with the competencies we want new attorneys to have when they enter the profession. And if we start with the competencies and work backwards to the curriculum, it seems like we would be modifying our curriculum regardless um, of which pathway a student might choose. So I think it's helpful for me to understand what we mean by status quo in A versus what we need by option B. So um, option B would reflect a curriculum like under consideration by Oregon or like D Daniel Webster. And per perhaps you're right that it could be a question of like universal design. So depending on what the exam looks like and what the non-exam pathway looks like, a law school could design one curriculum to rule them all, right? So it's possible that uh, the law school checklist for this increase in units, experiential units and clinics and practica would be exactly what you would do anyway for the new exam, but that for this pathway, it would be a prescribed, this is, we want actually 21 units of experiential coursework, including X, Y, Z, right? So but it is possible that that you could look at both of the outcomes for the new exam and the non-exam and design a curriculum that is meeting all requirements but these these requirements would be spelled out for non-exam does that make sense hopefully <laughs> it, it does yeah thank you i i think i just think about it differently and so that's why i'm struggling with the difference between the two but thank you for the explanation Charles. Uh, good morning. I'd first like to start off by apologizing for being a few minutes late. I had a, some technological issues logging in, so thank you for uh, bearing with me on that. Uh, I, I really do want to say that uh, a few of the comments that Alex Chan uh, just put forward really threw into relief a concern that I've been having for a little bit of time. And that is my perception that there seems to be an almost intractable trade-off between the requirements that would need an experiential pathway to licensure to ensure uh, institutional rigor, because uh, law firms do not have, and so private practitioners don't have the same uh, pedagogical pedigree that literal educational institutes do, and to ensure that there is adequate supervision and true education still occurring during the supervised practice and the need to ensure equitable access to the program. The more implementation of individual checkpoints where we assure that uh, supervision is being sufficient, the greater a burden and more onerous it becomes to, to facilitate such a system, especially at the scale, as we've discussed, uh, of a state of the size of California with the number of, of students we have coming in every year. And 
historically, when there have been issues of access, when there aren't enough uh, supervisors, those issues of access and equity have disproportionately fallen on outgroups and minority groups. And while we are at a stage where that could still be addressed, uh, to steal another phrase or paraphrase from Alex, that there's we're at a point where we don't quite have, you know, adequate implement implementation detail here. Uh, that lack of, or that, or at least I'll say my perception of the intractable trade-off there gives me concerns about how we can balance those very important concerns. Um, Charles, let me ask you, I mean, are those, I, I think everybody on this commission um, shares the concerns. Um, I would um, proffer a solution from where we sit today that we um, make sure that we're very clear in any recommendation that is um, uh, done so to the extent that we think that um, those concerns can be mitigated um, uh, and, and leave that to the Supreme Court and uh, to make a determination as they build, if they choose to um, uh, build the program. I don't know that we can solve those um, as a commission. I don't know that we can um, I mean, if that's a if that's a gating issue, um, uh, I, I'm not I'm not sure how we move forward. I, I do believe that's a big problem, um, I, but I think it's one that's going to take a lot of time and effort and thoughtfulness um, during the process to figure out whether or not it can be solved. Um, if we're walking from one problem into a bigger one uh, on 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 that issue. Uh, that's going to be unacceptable for everybody. So I appreciate the comments. I do understand them, um, but I but I do think that um, uh, we can probably figure out a way to um, capture some language that gives everybody comfort. Absolutely. I just don't. I don't like bringing up you know a point without having at least a potential solution to offer. But it, it's a concern that I've had for some time, and Alex's comments made me uh, be able to crystallize that, and I felt the need to vocalize it. So thank well, you. Well, I, I really appreciated. Um, uh, you're vocalizing it. Tracy? Thank you. So um, just a couple of points again to share. Um, you know, with regard to the non-exam pathway, the uh, what's articulated here, the hours uh, post-law school, the summative capstone for an exam, just a, you know, friendly reminder that all of that would be developed based upon the CAFA report. So when we're wondering what we're going to assess, it would go back to that report and it would say this is the uh, entry level knowledge, skills and abilities that need to be evaluated. And so that would be something that would be articulated in your plan of supervised hours, your summative capstone, your portfolio, that would tell you what would be expected. Same thing as you have your exam blueprint or test specification. So that's really what you would be doing. The other thing that's, that's important that, that um, always you know, gives me pause is when I hear that the schools are preparing students for an exam. That's not what the goal should be. The goal should be that schools are preparing students to practice in the profession. They're giving them that broad-based knowledge to go out there, that foundation, and then depending upon the area of law or what profession they're in, that's when they specialize. And that's what your exam should do. Your exam uh, looks at the occupational analysis that says all of this is important for entry level. And that's what our school is teaching. Of that, what is most critical to be assessed? And it should all match up. It shouldn't be, I'm going to school to prepare for the exam. It's I'm going to school to prepare for the profession. I'm going to take a test. And that's going to tell me if I'm competent and to move on. That's why we link everything up together. So I think, again, you know, talking about changes with law schools and so forth, the exam should be a surprise. It should be linked right back to the law school, the supervised practice. And going back to concerns about, you know, supervised practice, the Board of Behavioral Sciences in Business and Professions Code 4980 they actually outline all the requirements for supervisors and the areas to be uh, evaluated. And again, link back to their uh, occupational analysis or here at your CAPA study. Thank you. 
Uh, Emily, right before I get to you, um, let, I'd like to move to option C for a moment because it's relevant, I think, to uh, what Tracy just said. Um, Audrey, can we push to option C? All right, so option C, um, status quo program of legal education with no modification. So just as it exists, the supervised practice hours as we've discussed, the summative capstone portfolio. So, and then, so yes, go ahead. So, so, the, so the difference between option A, B and C is all around law school requirements and the comments yeah. Tracy just made, um, you know, status quo on legal education, really the, the, the difference between A and C is that we would make it specific to the capital requirements. Um, and so to the extent, Tracy, your comment earlier, um, I think that there is a, uh, I'm gonna read into this a little bit, but I think based on all of our conversations and our recommendation around the exam, there is a, has been a consensus up until now for this group, from this group to try to tailor around those Kappa um, study um, suggestions and recommendations. And so um, that this would be um, the only big difference between A, B, and C uh, is whether or not you want uh, current amount of um, practice um, with uh, uh, Kappa, with no Kappa, or additional um, education requirements. Um, Emily, um, go ahead. Thanks. I, I just wanted to also quickly address, I think, what Charles and Alex are talking about, and I appreciate that thought, and I absolutely think that we need to think about it, and I guess I will just sort of remind too, in terms of the bar exam, um, the, the discrepancies amongst um, minorities and non-minorities for bar exam passage is horrendous. <laughs> and so I do think that we can map out something either way um, that will do better than we've been doing. It's just, it's, it's you know, and I think you agree with me. Um, but I wanted to address um, uh, Jackie's, point, um, just as it relates, I guess, to, to options A, B, and C. And just so I'm clear, um, option A was status quo, but it, can, can we go back, Audrey, to option A slide, just so I understand? So status quo, but checking to make sure that the units, those six units match and are modified to reflect kappa. Okay, so, cause currently, so, okay. All right, so that makes sense. So the, the like in, it would, that would have to include then like alternative dispute resolution or negotiation. We couldn't just have, you couldn't just have six units of a water law clinic where right. you never saw, you know, some of these built, never built some of the Kappa skills. Is that right? right. So it would be okay. some level of like transcript review maybe on our end to make sure that what those six units were reflected the Kappa skills and abilities. Okay, so Whereas that's giving C, much more breadth than what the law schools currently have to do. The C would be no change at all. Okay. People can and, take what, whatever at, at their six units. Okay, and then the B would maybe be A plus. <laughs> Is that right. right? So we would say yes to the Kappa. And also yes to an, uh, expanded requirement beyond the six units, okay. whether it be something that looks like the Daniel Webster curriculum or the Oregon curriculum or something totally different, but expanded um, clinics, practica, experiential requirements beyond the six units. Okay. Um, and so I, I would just say that, you know, if, if you're going to have, so I, I also just like, um, uh, Susan, I kind of keep in mind non-California law schools. I know we don't really have to, but I, I don't want to leave them out. Um, and so I would just say that if the if the requirement for a student who is in law school can be met by elective, like taking more electives in law school to meet that pathway, I think that's great as long as that can happen. I will say if we're just thinking about California, I think in terms of whatever the curricular requirements are from this California State Bar, I would much prefer them to be the same whether you're taking the exam or you're doing the uh, non-exam pathway. 
So if that is, look, we've got to, you know, you have to take administrative law because that's one of the recommendations. And you now, because we need you to have so much more in depth knowledge of these skills, you're actually going to need to take more than six units. Um, you know, I would be, I would suggest that one, that the state bar does that for both paths. Um, because I think that there's a lot of students that are not going to know until their last semester what they're going to do. And they also, if they don't pass the bar, they're going to want to have this option and not have to go back to school to try to figure that out. So um, I, I, I also think that the next gen bar exam is also going to take all law schools to this place where we're going to have to have more skill training. So to the extent that we do require, I, I would not go so far as TPAR to say you need to have 15 units, but right now we have six. If you double that to 12, and I think that's probably too much too, but if you, even if nine to 12 or something, you're, you're talking about 400 to 600 hours um, in law school. So just food for thought to think about like trying to, in my opinion, trying to keep it consistent no matter what path people are choosing. Mylin. Um, what Emily said gave me so much food for thought. A couple of things that I just wanted to say ditto to um, the point about the curricular requirements being equal, the same, whether you take the bar, the exam path or the non-exam path, I um, agree with 100%. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to decide and distinguish between modifying the law school requirements versus, um, sorry, expanding them versus just modifying them to um, tailor them toward the CAPA results. One point, sort of a side point is, if we are, any of these that say modify, leave it at six ex, uh, experiential units, but modify them to align with CAPA, they can't possibly align with all of the Kappa requirements. Six units is nowhere near enough. So it would have to be some of them. And, and I don't know how that would work out, but we have um, too many uh, doctrines and too many skills to be taught within six units, um, which is why I was leaning towards expanding, increasing, the law school requirements for someone to succeed on the um, non-exam pathway. Then I started looking at, um, wondering what we mean by summative capstone portfolio. I have been thinking of that as some universe of skills and knowledge that need to be demonstrated. And what I guess I was trying to say earlier is that, or, or I, hang on, this is, a, I guess, a question um, that goes back to what Donna was saying. If there is a component of that portfolio, to put it in concrete terms, suppose um, successful client interview, right? That's something we want to, um, every licensed attorney to be able to demonstrate before, uh, before candidate to demonstrate before they're licensed. Is that successful client interview, however it's measured through a video, through a transcript, whatever, um, can that be submitted in law school and do you get credit for it? I guess that's my question. Not whether we it must be submitted in law school, but um, the portfolio components, can they be, um, created if not submitted so the other if the answer to my first question is no can i use my third year in-house clinic client interview um, videotape to submit six months after i graduate as part of my portfolio um let me address that for a moment i mean i i i think that is um 
analogous to the question we had around supervised practice um, during law school, um, third year otherwise. And I, I heard a number of people that were concerned about that. I, I can't say that it was a, in any way a consensus, but some people that believed that um, supervised practice uh, should be post law school for a couple of different reasons that were expressed. Um, the, I think it would be the same with, with, with assessment. Um, we would be able to make in our recommendation if we thought that, for instance, in the last semester of your third year, um, you could do some of those um, capstone assignments um, for submission. Um, I personally uh, believe it probably would fall in supervised practice and not in law school. I was, I was uh, compelled by uh, the conversation that we had regarding um, the amount of time in law school that should be spent on law school um and and less on um worrying about the assessment um but but nevertheless um we can try to add that in on a recommendation when we get there um amy yes with regards to emily's comment about the minority pass rate for the california bar exam the, the minority disparity didn't start with the law school and it didn't start with the California bar exam. It started earlier. It started back potentially in that bar candidate's college, their high school, their, their learning environment that they grew up in. And it concerns me that we might be skirting the issue on how to address the disparity for minorities and the pass rate for the California bar exam. I'm done speaking. Um, Amy, what uh, do you have in that thought process? Is, is there a um, different path, a recommendation, a suggestion um, that you think we're not addressing that we should address? Well, we're putting a lot of emphasis on what law schools should and shouldn't do in terms of potentially fielding a non-pathway alternative for being admitted to practice law in the state of California. And I'm wondering if that onus is appropriately put onto the law schools or if it should be something where we can get, I, I feel that experience is what matters. And agreed, six units, there's no way. There's no way, that's not enough time. I don't even know if anything less than 2000 hours is enough time to adequately prepare a candidate for the practice of law. So is the onus on the law school only or should, in California, should there be curriculum that goes to the university level that starts that preparation earlier so that when they're in law school and they get to the law school scenario, they're already, they already are exposed. They already have some potential experience and training so that when they do graduate from law school, exam or no exam, what have you, they're much more prepared to enter the field of, of practice. It's just food for thought and playing devil's advocate on that issue. Uh, Alex. Um, for this option, I'm going to put on my public protection hat, and I would say that having performed quite a few law school inspections at various law schools in California, I can safely say that some schools are not endeavored to better preparing the students for the legal profession. This option, in my view, would actually encourage these schools to stick to their status quo. And with no exper experiential learning requirement, I am very concerned that law, law students will also simply flock to the easiest classes just to acquire their units and then meet their graduation requirement. And that's my concern with this option, that it is probably the easiest way out with no skin in the game for law school or law, or law students. And, and that's just my opinion. 
Uh, Jackie, I, right, Jackie, right before you go, I, I do want to point out in the conversation we're having around DEI that unfortunately, um, Brian Harrison and Christine Rossi both are not here today, and they are um, the chair and vice chair of COAF, um, and I think are an important voice on, on this topic. And so um, uh, hopefully um, we can um, reach out to them and hear from them at the beginning of the next meeting. Um, uh, Jackie. Thank you, and uh, really great points are being raised. I, I wanted to, to move us away slightly from the law school requirement to the supervised practice and assessment piece. And David, I'm wondering if you could speak to, I know actually the NCBE is well ahead of California um, when it comes to really trying to figure out a valid and reliable supervised practice assessment. And we received a little bit of information about that. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak more about that, that since that seems to be a, a big concern for this committee. Jackie, I, I, uh, I'm not that close to uh, the work that's going on with NextGen to be able to make a, uh, um, a helpful comment about that. Um, but uh, certainly uh, I'm sure they'd be, be glad to comment on any questions this group might have. I'm sorry I can't help you on that. I'm, I'm actually not, not really understanding what, what initiative there may be with respect to supervised practice. But um, again, uh, I'm sure somebody could, uh, could add to the conversation if they were asked. Well, well uh, Jackie, I'm gonna move to option D because um, supervised practice on option D is removed completely. Um, uh, uh, Audrey, if you don't mind, let, let's keep moving here. Um, and it goes straight in from law school to assessment. And so um, just in an effort to move through this, um, I guess let me begin with, is there anybody um, who is interested in discussing an option that does not have supervised practice as a part of it? And Alex, you still have your hand up. Sorry about that, Chair. Okay. So this would be the expanded regulated curriculum piece, no supervised practice and the summative portfolio. Um, okay, let's move on to option E uh, without any comments of uh, many members. Um, okay, so option E is status quo program of legal education paired with the supervised practice hours at the concurrently with whatever our version of the Canadian prep program would end up looking like online modules and person workshops, simulated law firm in person capstone. That's kind of the several Canadian jurisdictions do that prep model. This is also very similar to in Ontario, they have a law practice program that contains something like prep where they're doing the online courses and in-person work. And then they have a, a shortened um, work placement. So something, our version of that alongside supervised practice and then licensure. And so um, what I wanna do is just take a moment on each one of these. Um, we've obviously understand the, the different iterations of law school requirements. We've discussed that a good portion of today's meeting. We had a conversation a little bit about supervised practice, um, a difference of opinion, maybe a number of hours uh, and some controls around the supervisors um, and now we're really focused on option E and assessment. And so we had um, discussed one type of assessment previously, and, and now this is another option that we saw um, uh, in practice in, in, in a couple of different jurisdictions. So I'd love uh, a conversation around assessment, whether we believe that this kind of practice readiness assessment um, versus a, a summative capstone, if there's uh, one that um, the group believes is maybe um, a better result uh, for this option. Uh, Judge. You're on mute. Sorry about that. In the supervised practice subgroup, I there was a presentation on the practice readiness education that was fairly in depth and it was, it was actually very impressive uh, and it was very holistic uh, with, and it dovetails to a large degree with the Kappa um, uh, skill set uh, conclusions. 
uh, and it it's it it is a it's effectively this segue into um, uh, you know talking to clients and and resolving issues and and uh, talking in court and, and a number of, uh, you know, interwoven ethical issues associated with all those issues, you know, civility among counsel, those kinds of things. And, and so to me, uh, it, it, A, I thought it was phenomenal. B, it, it would overcome some of the concerns I've heard expressed this morning about being sort of locked into a very specific supervised practice that really wasn't as, didn't have the kind of breadth that you would necessarily want uh, to, to constitute that that um, that pathway, and so uh, while I my only comment today was I thought that hours needed to be sort of ramped up uh, because of the um, uh, of the of of some of some similar concerns. If there was an assessment, uh, a practice readiness education program, uh, that would uh, that would soften my view toward the number of hours needed to get ready to uh, uh, submit your portfolio to the bar exam committee for the supervised practice pathway. Uh, thank you. Susan? Uh, one point, um, I, I agree with the judge that the comments we saw and the programs we saw from Canada were impressive and did have the kind of breadth that might create some of the good transition that we are all hoping would be reflected in our new lawyers. Um, I would just like to add the point that I would like to see this practice readiness education program be provided by the state bar at little to no charge and that this not become a substitute for commercial bar preparation and that we don't let commercial industry take this over, but we have the state bar take it over and control it and make sure that the subject matter really does meet the needs and, and rises to that level that we saw really nice materials out of Canada. Um, any other comments or thoughts on the different types of assessments? Okay, let's move um, to option F, I think we can probably pass it pretty quickly. Um, it has the same issue we talked about before with no supervised practice. It didn't seem like we had um, a lot of traction around that. Um, right. <clears throat> so what if we require those units to match up with CAFA, the six units, and that's all, and then do that prep program without supervised practice? Audrey, let's go ahead and turn to option G because I think it's... Um, Kind of a third option around assessment um, and again a lot of these pieces are interchangeable um, uh, potentially um, and so uh, thoughts around uh, two performance tests which is really the the, the difference here i want to focus on the assessment uh, portion um, as opposed to the um, uh, uh, two other assessments that we just discussed Emily? I, I guess I'm not a fan just because we don't know what the performance tests, quote unquote, are going to look like next. And I would not want to do two performance tests as the assessment based on what we currently have as performance tests. So I would be a no on that. Jackie? I have a question for Tracy, and this is just my lack of understanding of the psychometrics um, of, of this. I, as I understand it, the MBEs play a really important role in terms of the validity, consistency, and reliability um, as it relates to the essays and, and, and PTs currently. So if we just had two free-floating PTs, do we struggle with the exact same um, issues that we do if it was a capstone portfolio? Um, your issues would be, again, if you tie it back to your CAFA study and identify the content of those performance tests, what would be most appropriate to capture in those tests, tied back to your own study. Yeah, and I, I understand that for content purposes. I guess I'm trying to understand, I mean, one of the things that we have to think about is consistency, reliability, validity. 
And I know in the current test, we really rely on that MBE as a backstop. And we're worried in our other options that how would we establish that for supervised practice and a capstone portfolio? Do we run into the same issues with supervised practice and two performance tests in terms of establishing kind of the, the baseline of, of validity, reliability, and consistency? No, you can you can do that on your own. You don't have to rely on the NBE. You can you can again if you link it back to your own studies, you can establish the validity and the reliability and so forth. I, and so I'm sorry, I, I'm still struggling with this because I remember you said, look, it's going to take a lot of time, money, and energy to figure out kind of the supervised practice piece and the capstone portfolio piece. Wouldn't it take the same time, energy, and money? to figure out the supervised practice and to performance test piece? Or is there something different about it? No, same thing. Same okay. time, Except energy, cost. Yeah. Except for maybe, Tracy, the standardization part, right? So we have two performance tests that's standard to everyone in the pathway versus their experience in supervised practice and the calibration it might take to look at all these different, you know, practice areas and their portfolios and, and looking, that's not, that's not as the standardization piece I would think would be easier with this type of assessment. Right. I would say overall, if you're just doing two performance tests, it'll be less cost, <clears throat> less time, less energy, but it's still a big piece. It would, it would be somewhat equivalent to developing a test, you know, another written test or multiple choice. Mylin? To the extent that we're talking about having a two day high stakes, all or nothing exam at the end of the supervised practice, um, I would not support this for the, um, because I, it's my understanding of the research is, and I'm happy to be corrected. My understanding is that the, in, the racial and socioeconomic inequity that we see with students entering law school at the end of law school and then um, in uh, is exacerbated by the by any high stakes somewhat standardized testing so i think that this is perhaps our least um, uh, uh, equitable option so far so i would not support it for that reason Any other comments on option G? Josh, I would just say what we could also think about just the assessment part, just being maybe not even two performance tests. If we look at the uh, Law Society of Ontario model, they have a barrister solicitor exam that you could take at any time in the licensure process, it's seven hours open book. I mean, like, so this could be slightly fungible in terms of test, not necessarily having to land on two performance tests. I mean, that could be a point of discussion because this option G then would look a lot like the Ontario model if the assessment piece was a test, you know, to be developed later, maybe something more similar to what they have in their exam, which is open book, seven hours taken at any time during the process. Just, just a thought. Okay. Alex? Thanks, Chair. My view about this option is it's probably, it, it strikes the best balance of both worlds, of all the stakeholders. I, I think one concern is about the non-exam pathway is that it lacks an objective and uniform standard in evaluating whether someone meets the minimum competence. But on the other hand, this option actually removes those concerns by offering as part of this option, a standardized performance, one that incurs, as, as um, uh, Tracy just mentioned, incurs less time, less costs. And it's actually pretty objective because all the graders have a rubric from which they, um, uh, they, uh, they follow. With that said, I, I wanna go back to the Ont Ontario model because I'm looking at the PDF file that was circulated. My understanding is that model, and maybe chair, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it costs $4,700. Is that, do I read that right? That the cost to adopt that model will be that much? I don't, um, 
I, I don't have that information. Audrey, do you want Alex, to I'm sorry, what was that point of reference, Alex? Um, the Ontario model that I'm looking at in terms of cost, it says yes. each candidate pays a licensing fee of $4,700. Yes. That was in the report, the 2018 report, and, and it's possible those fees have gone up since then, right? So that is far more than someone who will pay Barbary plus the exam fees that they would pay to the bar, state bar to take the bar exam, I, I would imagine, or at least on the on par with that number. And that's- They are instituting, part of that recommendation from 2018 is to have a minimum compensation requirement for their articling. So they are going to have um, a minimum compensation for their supervised practice uh, and not, I mean, to say that that makes up for the cost, but that is part of the recommendations. So how do we address the DEI issue then for applicants who simply can't afford that much amount of money? And this, if anything, encourages and offers even more advantage to those applicants who have immense resources. Are you back my time? Um, I don't believe it, it, cost is a, a fair concern. I, I don't, I have, uh, other than the Ontario um, report that you're referring to, um, I'm looking at now on page 17, of specifically what their costs were, it's very hard for us to know ours. I think part of this process is going to be um, after our recommendation and taking some estimates on, on what the cost is going to be. Um, I am going to, uh, so I'm not ready to, to, to opine on that, uh, but, I, but I do see um, uh, the Ontario cost without knowing exactly what goes into it. Um, I'm going to um, take Leah out of turn because I know her well enough that she probably will address this partially. Leah? Yeah, I, I will. Um, I've uh, had a little bit of exchange with staff about um, us learning more about the costs, uh, the underlying cost structure in Ontario, because certainly we're much bigger and there will be economies of scale at play. And so if we better understand how the Ontario costs are derived or how they're built, we'll know which of those elements are um, appropriate for an economies of scale analysis, meaning the base cost will be the same and we will have many, many more um, sort of applicants to spread that cost over than Ontario does. So some of the costs obviously are dependent on, on the number of applicants, but others aren't. So I would, uh, I think just uh, akin to what you said, uh, Josh, we're not ready to uh, just assume what the cost will be in California based on the Ontario uh, model, but we will be looking into that and hopefully uh, we'll have more information perhaps at, at the next meeting to share. Alex, you have any additional comments? No, this is very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Neil. Yeah, just a quick thing. Again, going back to the LSO Law Society of Ontario 2018 report, Part of what's uh, is documented there in their survey is that quite a few folks, while they're in supervised practice, do get paid. However, some folks don't, and that's identified as a potential equity issue as well. So that's something to factor in as well. Thank you. Um, Audrey, I think at this point, uh, what probably makes the most sense, it, this is not a perfect science. Um, and there's a lot of, um, at this point, right? Not, not in us um, thinking through the different options. Um, I think there is a lot of um, different uh, possibilities, but I wanna try to uh, narrow them as much as possible for the next conversation. So I think at this point, um, I would ask uh, the members of this commission to take a look at the different options that were sent to that we just went over and that you've seen um, and to make a determination um, on which ones um, you think are worth continuing to discuss. And to do that, I would say um, uh, vote on your top three. And Audrey, if we can do a show of hands as we walk through each one of them, I yep. think that'll allow us to um, to start focusing in on, for instance, the law school requirements um, and get a little more information to folks before our next meeting. Um, I'd like to do that uh, and then break for lunch and we'll come back and uh, deal with um, out of state and foreign attorneys. Okay.
Um, that sounds good. I did. This is part of what we'll. Oh, and let me take. Sorry. Yeah, let me take David's question first, please. David. Uh, yeah. It, is there a grid? Has anybody prepared a grid of of of, of all these options in, in rows and columns? I, I, I haven't seen one. I was just wondering if there was one. It might be very very helpful. No, I've just prepared um, the stack with the, you know, all the requirements okay. kind of listed out. So not, okay. not, not a grid. Okay, thanks, Doug. But I, but I do think now that we've been through it, that that would be helpful and we can prepare it. Um, it'll be a little more limited based on um, uh, people's preferences. But, uh, but just, I believe what's, uh, what, what I see occurring here is that we will end up with a conversation um, in a little more detail next time and hopefully to a resolution around how we see the law school requirements uh, around um, supervision hours um, and some of the um, regulation around the supervision that it gets people more comfortable and um, around the potential types of assessments. Um, we've seen th uh, three options here. Um, and so maybe uh, based on the vote and tally how it goes, David, we'll, we'll try to create a grid for the next meeting. Emily, uh, when we vote, are we can we vote with our hand, the Zoom hand as opposed to our hand hand? Right? Is that what we're doing? Prefer, yeah, yeah preferably Zoom hand, so I can tally them, and then you're only going to vote for three. Thanks. Okay, I'm I'm going to remove myself from this process. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to let Audrey run it. Uh, sounds great. Okay, so I think what would be helpful is I'm going to. Sorry, I'll go back all the way to the beginning. And hopefully you've had time as we've gone through to check or star or even mentally, which ones you, you want to raise your hand for. And then again, only raise your hand for three. And I will, um, I will be, and Amy's gonna be helping me, which is just to make sure I get the count right. <laughs> I will be looking at your Zoom hand raised to tally. So. You also um, received um, count uh, votes from uh, Dr. Henderson. So oh, did we get clarification on if, yes, if that's we, okay? We can incorporate them here. Okay, so you will be, can you be that hand maybe or let me know? Oh, wait, I, I have it. I'm just not looking at it because I'm sharing my screen. <laughs> yes, no problem. I will um, pull up his votes and incorporate them here. Okay, perfect. Thank you for um, getting resolution on that, Amy. Okay, so option A, as it's on your screen, please raise your Zoom hand if this is one of your three. Keep, leave it up until, yeah, so I can make sure I get all these, sorry. Um, So, um, Audrey, um, do you have a count of uh, nine? Um, let me yeah. just make sure. Okay. Uh, we need to add Dr. Henderson, who voted for A as well. So that would be a total of 10. I have 10. Thank you. Yes. Okay, please put your hands all down. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, for bag keen reasons, we couldn't do like a fun Zoom poll, but okay. So let's go to option B um, as displayed on your screen and discussed. Can you please raise your hands if you like option B out of your three? And that was one for Dr. Henderson or no? No. I have eight? Eight. eight. Okay, perfect. Please put your hands down. <laughs> David, can you put your hand down so I can make sure that I don't count the next time? Sorry. Thank you. Okay. 
please raise your hand if you like option C as one of your three. Uh, Dr. Henderson um, voted on C. Okay. So that makes it two? Yes. Okay, please put your hands down. Um, can you please raise your hand if you like option D? And that's not one of Jen's? No. Okay. So that's no one, which is fine. Um, option E. And Dr. Henderson is uh, voting, voted on E. Voted yes on E? Okay. Yes on E. Okay. Did you get seven, Amy? Yes. Seven. Perfect. Please put your heads down. Heads, hands down. <laughs> you don't have to put your heads down. All right. Hands down. Perfect. Option F. Anyone for F? Great. Um, and then option G. Please raise your hands. And that was, Jim already had three? Yes. Okay, so then I see three hands. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, sorry. More hands. More hands. Four. Okay. Did anyone not vote for three and want me to add their tally back to any of the options? Okay, so I have A, B, and E as the top three. Okay, now I, I wanna be very clear that, that um, this is, does not mean we're going with one of these options. This is just to narrow the conversation um, and we'll, really start to focus um, in our next meeting around the law school requirements around the supervised practice and around what assessment um, we're interested in um, discussing as a recommendation. Um, Audrey, I think at this point, unless you have something else you want to do, um, we're going to take a lunch break, um, come back in uh, 18 minutes at 1220. Um, and then we will pick up with um, out-of-state and foreign attorneys. Did I, did I miss anything? You look like you want to add. <laughs> I just had a thought, which is, and we, maybe it's better to wait until the August meeting, but do you, should we have an option that is not moving forward with any of the non-exam options, just because that came up several times in the discussion? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think that, um, that that absolutely exists. I mean, I don't think, that, that absolutely exists, and it's one that, um, uh, we're going to talk about if we can't come to consensus that that's where, okay. we, where we end up. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you, everybody. Let's reconvene in uh, 17 minutes.
All right, folks, it's 1221. It looks like we have most people returning. So we're going to turn to um, item 2B on the business agenda, uh, discussion recommendation of pathways to licensure for out-of-state law school applicants, out-of-state attorneys, foreign attorneys, and foreign educated applicants. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amy Nunez, um, and Amy's going to walk us through it. All right. Uh, thank you, Josh. And good afternoon, Commission. Uh, we have a PowerPoint um, that we're getting ready to get up. Okay, wonderful. So uh, today's presentation is intended to help the BRC gain perspective on what the bar exam requirements uh, could be for out-of-state and foreign attorneys. So I'm going to focus on the various ways, the various ways in which out-of-state attorneys practice law in California right now. I'll be presenting specifically on the special admissions programs. Um, which allow attorney applicants in other jurisdictions uh, the ability to practice law in California under special considerations. I'll describe the program parameters to help the uh, group understand how these are different from full licensure. And then I'll describe the current process for out of state and out of country attorneys to get licensed in California and how this compares to other jurisdictions. Uh, lastly, I'm going to highlight the volume of attorney applicants for both out of state and out of country uh, attorney applicants and what that's looked like for, for the past 10 years. So with that, let's get started and start with uh, the next slide, please. So here, I'm gonna describe the multi-jurisdictional practice uh, licenses that exist. So these are the different programs. As I mentioned earlier, these programs allow attorneys, attorney applicants who are in good standing in their, uh, in their home jurisdiction the ability to practice in California. And as you will see, each one has very specific parameters. So one thing about all of the NJP attorneys, which are these first three categories, a registered in-house counsel, registered legal aid attorney, and registered military spouse attorneys, they all are required to apply for a moral character determination um, and to satisfy that requirement and receive a positive determination. Mm -hmm. They must all abide by all of the rules that uh, govern licensees in the state of California, which include uh, minimum continuing legal education requirements uh, to satisfy their first year, the um, MCLE requirements, including ethics education mm -hmm. and the compliance that's required every three years that uh, needs to be satisfied related to MCLE requirements. So also all are required to register, each of these categories to register with the state bar prior to working. And as you'll see, as I walk through this, two of these three programs require a supervision by an attorney. So, Let's start with a uh, registered in-house counsel. Non-California attorneys from other jurisdictions can serve as registered in-house counsel, and they have to meet the following qualifications. The first is that they must uh, work for a qualifying institution, which is a corporation, a partnership, an association, or another uh, legal entity um, that has an office located in California. Uh, the qualifying institution must employ at least five uh, full-time employees or employ a California attorney who's an active licensee in good standing with the state bar. The registered in-house counsel also must reside in California. And the work of the registered uh, uh, in-house counsel is limited to providing legal services in California only to the qualifying institution that employs them. Uh, they're not allowed to make court appearances in California state courts or to provide personal or individual representation to any customers, stakeholders, um, uh, owners, uh, partners, officers, employees, servants, or agents of a qualifying institution. So um, again, they register with the state bar and then they're allowed to practice as in-house counsel uh, for that institution. And they're also allowed to provide a pro bono services in California. The next category uh, here is the registered legal aid attorney. Uh, these attorneys, again, must register with the state bar and work under the supervision of a California attorney. Uh, they're employed by, they must be employed by a California based organization that provides legal aid services in the state, uh, which uh, could be a nonprofit entity that's in good standing in California and in the state 
uh, or in the state in which they're incorporated, if it's other than California, and they must provide legal aid in civil matters, including family law and immigration law to indigent, indigent and disenfranchised persons, especially underserved client groups, such as elderly persons with disabilities, people of color, juveniles, uh, limited English proficient persons or nonprofit law schools that are approved by the ABA or credited by the state bar um, that provides legal aid. Um, entities that also receive IOLTA uh, pursuant to BMP code 6210 are also deemed to be eligible legal aid organizations. So attorneys practicing under the rules that are governed by a uh, governed registered legal aid attorneys may practice in California only while working with or without pay at, at the, the eligible legal aid organization. Uh, they, uh, they have supervision and, and can practice in all forms of legal practice that are permissible for a licensee of the state of California. As you can see here, their work is limited to no more than five years. Um, you can practice as a uh, RLAA for up to five years and cannot have taken and failed the bar exam within five years immediately preceding the initial application. Uh, the next category is uh, very similar. This is the registered military spouse attorney. This is one of the newest categories for special admission. This program is open to spouses of military personnel that are stationed and in active duty in California. An attorney practicing under this rule is permitted to practice law in California under supervision in all forms of legal practice, again, that are permissible for a licensed attorney, uh, much like registered legal aid attorneys, and also can uh, practice, uh, can pr uh, practice pr pr provide pro bono legal services. Um, here, the supervision is stricter than the other two MJP programs. Here, a supervisor must assist the count, must assist uh, counsel and provide direct supervision to the registered military spouse attorney, uh, approve any, uh, in writing, any appearances in court, depositions, arbitration, or any proceeding that the registered military spouse uh, attorney participates in. And they must read, approve, and personally sign pleadings, briefs, or other similar documents uh, that are prepared by the military spouse attorney. Um, the supervisor in instances may also de designate someone else to help when they're not available. And much like the re registered legal aid attorney, they uh, cannot have taken and failed the bar exam within five years immediately preceding the initial application and um, also must comply with the uh, other items that I described for all MJPs, uh, the MCLE requirements, um, positive moral character determination and the like. And the last category here is not a, an MJP, but it's rather a, um, a form of special admissions. And this is our registered foreign legal consultants. Uh, they are attorneys that are licensed in another country that, pro that can provide uh, legal advice in California exclusively um, on the rule of the law uh, in their foreign jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So they're required to um, register with the state bar, uh, be in good standing in their home jurisdiction, and obtain a positive moral character determination. And they are registered, uh, once they're registered with us, we appear on our website as a public protection measure. All right, next screen, please. So um, as you can see, uh, that was the, the that those are categories for uh, attorneys that are not fully licensed. Attorneys that want to become fully licensed here in California um, and have uh, have been uh, registered and practiced in another jurisdiction have to um, sit for the bar exam. I think we mentioned it before that we don't have reciprocity in California, and as such, everyone's required to sit for the exam. So out of state and out of country um, attorneys must sit and pass the bar exam mm -hmm. with US attorneys who have been admitted for four or more years uh, preceding the first day of the bar exam that they wanna take, they can elect to take a one day exam. So that what they get is the five uh, essay questions that are part of the bar exam and the performance test. They're not uh, required to take the MBE, the multiple choice section. Um, anybody who's practiced for less than four years in another jurisdiction must take both uh, the essay and PT as well as the multiple choice section of the exam. Next slide, please. 
So for applicants um, that are uh, foreign educated applicants, the foreign uh, law degree has to be determined uh, determined to be a first degree in law that um, that is that it's equivalent to a U.S. Uh, JD degree, and that it meets educational requirements uh, to be admitted in the country from which the applicant is coming from. So, if an applicant has been admitted in a foreign country or U.S. jurisdiction, uh, they're eligible to sit for the bar exam, and all but we simply need a certificate of good standing. However, if the applicant has not been admitted in a foreign country or U.S. jurisdiction, then it's, uh, it has to be determined, uh, an evaluation agency needs to determine whether that uh, degree um, is a foreign first degree in law. And um, they do, though, do that by uh, submitting uh, the official transcripts and analysis to the state bar. And um, as such, they also have to complete a um, U.S. Master of Law, an LLM degree, or one year of legal education in an LLM program. So that's 20 semester units. So once that uh, is completed, then uh, they can uh, sit and take the bar exam. So foreign educated applicants that do not have a first degree in law have to meet the educational requirements um, by earning a JD. And that can be done at a law school accredited by the ABA or accredited by the, uh, the state bar, or even by completing their education uh, through a law office study program. Next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned earlier, foreign uh, law students um, can, uh, foreign law, uh, foreign attorneys, excuse me, uh, their law degree must be determined to be a first degree in law. Um, and that, again, helps us ensure that it's equivalent to a US JD degree and, um, and that they met the educational requirements to be admitted in their home jurisdiction. Then in fact, if an applicant has been admitted in their home jurisdiction, they're eligible to sit for the bar exam. Um, all we need is simply is a certificate of good standing in order for that to happen. Okay, next slide, please. So um, one of the questions that we received in the past is, how do other jurisdictions handle foreign law school graduates? Um, and so what we identified is that 35 jurisdictions allow graduates of foreign law school to sit for their bar exam. And they align with our, many align with our state requirements. 20 require the additional education in the US if an applicant has not been licensed in their country of origin. So as we require an LLM degree as part of the, um, or those LLM uh, credits, uh, there are 20 other jurisdictions in the, in the US that require that as well. Five require, there are five jurisdictions that require that somebody else be admitted to another US jur jurisdiction in order to be licensed in their jurisdiction. That is, in some states you have to have been admitted uh, to another state in order, uh, in order to apply uh, as a foreign law school graduate in the US, in their jurisdiction. And uh, nearly all of the jurisdictions specify that the law, this law degree must be uh, based in common, uh, English common law. And then also uh, many require a determination of educational equivalency uh, like the California State Bar does. Next slide. So you know, when we're talking about how to um, uh, handle out of state or uh, consider out of country attorneys in the, uh, for an exam pathway or non-exam pathway, we've seen this before, uh, these statistics. This is the volume of applicants that we're talking about. So this is a statistic, you know, the statistics from the period between February 2000 and July 2021. And as you can see here, these are the category of applicants. The uh, third and fourth column represent the out-of-state law schools and out-of-state attorney applicants. So we roughly, in that 10-year or 11-year period, we have 31,000 uh, applicants that are from out-of-state law schools and about 20, let's say it's 26,000 roughly out of um, uh, state attorneys uh, that are applying as well as in terms of our foreign JD or foreign attorneys, we have 8,600 roughly that apply, that have applied in this 11 year period. 
So uh, this is just to give you a sense of the volume of applicants that we get in these categories. Next slide, please. And, um, and this is just a highlight of, of what that looks like. So those attorneys, out-of-state law school attorneys are represented in the orange, out of um, state, uh, sorry, that's law school, out-of-state attorneys are represented in the gray, and foreign JDs or foreign attorneys are represented there in the gold. So it's a, a smaller population than uh, obviously California law school. Next slide, please. Okay, that might be it. Yes. So with that, I'm going to open it up. If anybody has any questions about any of the um, current categories, about uh, the, the requirements for both out of state or out of country attorneys. Oh, Susan. Hi, Amy. Just a quick question. The two of the four initial categories you went over were limited to five years. Is there a reason it's five? Um, I would have to uh, dig into that, but I think, um, yeah, I would have to dig into that. Sudan, but so, I and I, I think, Susan, what I would say is that we are looking at all of those rules um, because we have some of the same questions um, and wanting to make sure that, for example, since the registered legal aid attorney category is intended to, among other things, other things ensure that we are um, creating a path to having people who can represent um, low income individuals in California. Um, we wanna make sure that we don't have any unnecessary barriers in the rules. Um, so we, we will be going through all of those rules and looking, um, looking at all of the requirements to make sure that we continue to think it's relevant, for example, whether or not you took and failed a bar exam in the past five years. All right, Neil. Yeah, so uh, based on that last graph, and thanks, thanks for all that information, it's super helpful. So it looks like to me that approximately somewhere around just under 2,000 individuals from outside of California or from a foreign uh, country jurisdiction uh, sit down and take the attorney, the, the bar exam here in California? Is, it, is that roughly right? Um, yes, roughly that's the so, so I'm curious to, to get a sense of whether the, the, there's an issue or do you, do you know, if, do, do we have a passage rate roughly of this group? Um, we, we do. So when we provide our general statistics um, mm -hmm. for every exam, uh, there is a breakdown between out of state um, uh, uh, general applicants as well as uh, out-of-state attorneys and um, foreign attorneys. So we do have those statistics. Do you, do you happen to know those numbers off the top of your head? <laughs> All right, <laughs> you know put you in a spot. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I can pull one up right now. Like uh, for yes. example, I could pull up uh, the more recent ones for the um, February bar exam. So if you give me one second, uh, those uh, we just reported back on. And um, I could share them here. Okay, so let me share my screen here. So as you can see here, uh, these are our statistics for the February 2022 uh, bar exam. We had a total of 3,451 uh, people sit and uh, take all portions of that exam. And here are numbers. And tell me if this is too small. I can try to make it a little bigger. Okay, here we go. These are statistics. Uh, these are by the law school type. Yeah. So uh, here we have separated uh, out of state ABA, what that pass rate looks like. Let me scoot this a little over. Um, and so the uh, of all takers, a pass rate is like 35.5%, or it was for this exam. For uh, foreign educated, those with the JD equivalent and the one year US education, we have 14.5% as the pass rate. Uh, US attorneys taking uh, the bar exam, these uh, are 74%. Foreign attorneys is 28.7%. So, so I see at least when it comes to um... Uh, attorneys from different states within the United States taking the exam, their pass rate is actually quite high relative to the rest of the group. And uh, it seems like the foreign attorneys, however, are, are on the other end of that scale. Yes, okay. uh, as well as foreign educated. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Top share. 
right. All right. Uh, Judge Reiser. Oh, uh, Judge, you're on mute. Once again, I'm on mute. Uh, Neil was a few steps ahead of me because I was going to ask for the stats as well. It, it would be helpful, I think, not just for the February exam, but to understand and appreciate the passage rate for experienced licensed attorneys in other jurisdictions uh -huh. uh, over a course of time, as well as foreign jurisdictions by country, because I think it would give us a sense of, you know, uh, if there's a difference between common law jurisdictions, which I suspect, and, you know, other um, non-common law jurisdictions. And, and it, t because if there's a problem, you know, we need to know the scope of the problem. If there's not a problem, then this Byzantine maze of regulations seems a bit, um, might be a bit out of touch. So, so I think, you know, stats would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Any other um, thoughts or questions around uh, the out of state or out of country attorneys? Okay, so I just want to remind everybody that um, when we were looking at the exam pathway, uh, you know, we had recommendations related to um, uh, what, you know, the uh, exam, whether we should have an exam pathway the topics as well as the skills that were required. And the last portion that we want to look at is how do we treat out of state and out of country attorneys? Maybe it's not something we want to answer now. It sounds like more information as the advisor has suggested, uh, such as its statistics on the various uh, pass rates for each of these categories would be helpful. Um, but it, I just want to uh, remind everybody, um, you know, why we presented this and, um, and the, uh, action that we still have in front of us, and that is a recommendation on um, how to um, incorporate um, out-of-state and out-of-country attorneys in a non-exam pathway, and eventually also when we get in an exam pathway and a non-exam pathway. Amy, maybe you can help us a little bit, because I know we had a um, conversation about it. I mean, what are the, um, what are the, the difficulties on the exam pathway? Um, that concern you uh, or that we should be um, grappling with uh, when it comes to out-of-state? Well, we looked at, um, for example, reciprocity, right? Um, so we, uh, in that, uh, we, pre uh, we had a chart that um, looked at how, how reciprocity functions um, specifically in, uh, in separating uh, issues such as um, the dynamic that California has, which is we have non-ABA law schools and how they're treated in other jurisdictions, uh, we discovered that um, there are jurisdictions that allow um, all school types, not just ABA law school types to be admitted in um, other uh, jurisdictions without having to sit for the bar exam. So that's what the reciprocity means. So I think the things that we have to consider too are, um, you know, and, and there were schools um, or other jurisdictions out there that had reciprocity uh, or required reciprocity. So I think the things that we have to grapple with too are, or would we be open to uh, allowing reciprocity? That is, attorney coming to California without having to sit for the bar exam. Um, and also, what do we do with um, uh, jurisdictions, or how do we handle jurisdictions that would not that would not allow non-ABA uh, JD graduates uh, entry into their jurisdiction without having to sit for the bar exam? Um, so that, uh, in terms of um, you know, just as a reminder of some of the uh, material that we've covered and how this comes together um, and looking at entry um, into full licensure, those are some of the big factors to also consider. But um, yeah, were you thinking something else, John? No, I, I just, I know that when we looked at the exam pathway and we talked about um, next gen, um, we did understand that we were moving away from um, reciprocity and portability, not entirely, but that it was going to make it more difficult in the decision making that we made um, as a commission. And that was, um, I, I believe, um, in that decision, we prioritized um, the need to focus on California um, and California law on the CAPA um, study. And so I'm, I'm not really sure that there's a lot we can do as a commission in a recommendation around reciprocity. That, that's something that's going to have to work itself over time. Um, unless, unless you or the staff disagree and you think there's 
some decision making that we should be considering. Um, you know, uh, uh, somebody said this earlier, Neil, um, in his, uh, when, he, when he talked about recommendations, I think he's mentioned that the more information or the more, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the or I guess um, specificity in that recommendation, the more helpful it will, it will be to the court. So perhaps you know we don't have to limit that as a recommendation to the court as a group. If, if the group feels you know uh, that reciprocity might be something that they want to recommend, perhaps do that. Um, it really depends on and uh, and it's up to the court how they would that kind of handle that, right? Potentially. Yeah, well, um, why don't we take the judge's comments and then I'll, okay. I'll, I'll continue. So, I mean, this is this is an important issue, especially when we're talking about the bar exam, because, and I said it the first day, and I haven't said it in months since then, but, you know, anecdotally, right, I had dozens of lawyers who appeared in front of me pro hack vice, and I don't know if that's a proper experimental group or not, but they were all competent. Every last one of them was competent. They've been practicing a lot in another jurisdiction, and it, it occurred to me, and it's always occurred to me that, that Forcing these folks to sit down for months and study for a bar exam after, you know, competently practicing law with no ethical uh, reports in, the, in their various jurisdictions over the course of, you know, five years or greater, four years or greater, doesn't really matter, just seemed like a, a, a punishment. And, 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 then, and then the question becomes, how much of this, how much of these requirements really are sort of the evolution of 19th century trade barrier protectionism, right? To, to keep uh, out-of-state lawyers out of California. And, and so, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty critical to talk about experienced lawyers in other jurisdictions who have, you know, good moral character, who've been in full-time law practice, who are competent. Why are we keeping them out of California? Why are we making them take a bar exam? It just, it seems so, uh, you know, counterintuitive to me, but that's only because I've been a practitioner for, you know, pushing 50 years. Tracy. Um, I would just like to uh, support those comments made by the judge. This is a trend we're seeing at the Department of Consumer Affairs, star. Uh, 200 plus professions um, that we license and regulate. Um, we're finding that transportability, reciprocity, things like this are extremely important. And if we find that practitioners um, are doing a good job, they're in good standing, they've been practicing for five years or more, um, as long as they you know, meet the reasonable requirements, have similar education expectations, um, there's a a movement toward accepting them into the state of California. Thank you. All right, Alex. Yeah, I think I agree with Judge Reiser, but I would only add one caveat. I actually would dissect this group of lawyers into two different groups. We have one group of lawyers who have practiced for a few years or many years and now moved to California to work for either a new company or a new law firm. For that group of lawyers, I absolutely agree. I think we are putting more hurdles for them to practice when we know they're more than competent. And then there's another group of lawyers who have not been practicing, who have been in dormant for a few years. And we actually have seen some of those in the, in the committee bar examiners that have been accused of practicing um, or engaged in the unauthorized practice of law in California. Those couple of lawyers clearly are not competent because they have not been practicing. They've been sitting dormant. They haven't really dealt with anything in law and now moved to California because they see new opportunities in the career that they want to pursue. Those couple of lawyers, I do think something must be done to ensure their competence to practice in California. Thank you. Um, And I and I'm sorry, and I hope no one is suggesting that this group of lawyers should be just, you know, should be admitted to practice in California with no hurdles, because I, I just don't see how that would benefit the public. And I, I maybe Tracy can opine on that, that your opinion may or may not apply to this group of lawyers. I, I don't know. But you know, th this is just my concern that something must be done to ensure the public is protected. 
Alex, I just want to make sure I understand the distinction that you're making. You're 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 saying these are individuals that are um, licensed to practice in another state, for example, but maybe haven't been practicing and doing something else. Correct. From a career standpoint, I, I, I'm struggling with how you make that distinction, right? They, 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 yeah, how many times do you have to be in court? How many contracts do you have to review? How many clients do you need to have? Like, how, how, how do you draw that distinction? I think this is going to be a collaborative effort. I think there are a group of lawyers who just take the bar exam in a different state, in states where the password is so high, it's pretty easy to get admitted. They get a license. And then they suddenly change career to work in real estate as a real estate agent. Actually, I do know a couple of examples there. And then now they move to California wanting to work for a law firm to litigate as a litigator. Now, I don't think anyone would be comfortable in saying those lawyers would have necessary competence to practice as a trial lawyer in the court of law. So what I think is something has to be in place to ensure that the public is protected. I don't know if that's the distinction that you're asking, but I certainly do understand there are different group of lawyers and we, we can't group all of them together in a single group and hoping that one solution would apply to all of them. I mean, it seems to me that's the reason, Amy, that we have the one day exam for attorneys from out of state that have five years or greater practice. Um, obviously, um, judge is saying that, you know, what do we need the exam? And Alex, I, I think that's kind of the distinction that we have currently have. Tracy. Could you, um, you know, establish a, a different kind of registration process where they have to, you know, demonstrate that they're actively practicing? I, I'm thinking of like, when we recruit our subject matter experts, you must be licensed you know, X number of years, you must be in good standing, you must be actively practicing. So there could be a series of criteria that they must meet to show that they're not just dormant in a state, because we have that same situation too. Um, so we have to be sensitive to that with our um, professionals that move to California. But again, just a thought, thank you. And I, I also want to remind everybody that um, uh, even when you look at uh, those uh, jurisdictions that allow admission on motion, that is the ability to come in, and not have to uh, sit for a bar exam in that jurisdiction, that uh, some of those requirements were uh, years of experience, so that um, and they varied uh, three to five years, some up to seven years, and um, they also uh, part of that requirement was that they had to have been recently active. So if somebody was dormant. Uh, they uh, they would probably not uh, qualify. It had to it, some of them were like you had to have practiced you know, three of the past five years, seven or seven of the past ten years, and the like. So I just want to remind folks that those parameters uh, exist in other jurisdictions as well. Um, Susan, Amy partially answered my question, which was. The admission on motion, I think some a little bit more detail about how other jurisdictions handle that, I think would make it easier to uh, assess those kinds of rules and restrictions and protections. But I also wonder, I have not looked at California's current Pro Hoc Vitae rules in a while, but do those not provide an additional kind of framework or something we might consider as well? Well, um, let me just say Pro Hoc Vitae is... Um allows attorneys from other jurisdictions to sit for a single case, right? So it's not uh, like- But they do provide some protections, right? You do have to be no ethical violations and there's a, there's some protections in there, right? Um, we, uh, no, there's less. Um, the, 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 uh, in terms of um, our background uh, requirements at the state bar, we uh, are oversee the NJP categories for Pro Hoc Vice, uh, come to us as a court order. So a judge uh, allows orders of, um, allows somebody to sit in on a case from outside counsel. And um, we basically uh, use the judge's order. So we'll, we do not conduct a background check in terms of uh, moral character determination, uh, nor the, um, the um, uh, certificate uh, seek a certificate of good standing from those applicants. So there's less that's done with pro hoc vitae applic uh, uh, applicants in California than we do with our uh, multi state juris jurisdictional practice attorneys. 
So um, the MJPs are vetted extensively more than uh, the Prabhakriche attorneys. Oh, Emily? Uh, I just wondered if we have any statistics on um, con complaints or consumer issues with out of state, like people that come in and take, you know, a, that are already licensed in another state versus California attorneys. I don't know if you know this, but do we, is there some rash of ethical violations about out of state attorneys that we're unaware of or something that would distinguish them from the regular group? So um, I think you know, you're asking about a discipline um, comparison, or rates of discipline uh, with um, out of state attorneys or out of jurisdiction attorneys compared to uh, California attorneys. Yes, and, much better put. <laughs> and uh, we don't, I don't have a hand, I, I haven't conducted that level of analysis, but it is something I can look at and perhaps bring back to the group when I bring the other statistics back. And keep in mind, obviously, that anything that doesn't rise to the level of um, um, a complaint that's been filed in the state bar court or discipline, discipline um, needed out, um, the complaints against out-of-state attorneys would be confidential to the same extent that complaints against in-state um, uh, uh, California-only attorneys would be. And I guess I, I just want to know, sort of, um, right under our current system, I, I guess, are you asking complaints against the registered legal aid attorneys, registered military spouse attorneys, registered in-house counsel? or complaints against attorneys who have been fully admitted both in California and in another jurisdiction? Yeah, I, I mean, and if it's too much to go and look at this data, I, I, I don't know that it's like super relevant. All I'm saying is I, 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 I guess I, I would want to know if, if we're concerned about consumer protection as a reason to not admit somebody who has practiced five years in another state essentially with a application and a background check and a you know moral character app and all of that, that we need them to also take an, a piece of our new exam. I'm just wondering why that would be. Are they more likely to be a problem than a minimally competent attorney? Because we presume five years out that they're more than minimally competent. So I just, I, I, I guess I'm also sort of stating my preference that I don't necessarily see the need to, but I, I could be convinced. I just don't see a need to have a one day exam plus five years. Um, but I'm also sensitive to Alex's point that, you know, an active attorney can, you know, just sit, even though they're active, sort of sit and do nothing, right? So I get that we want to make sure they have, you know, kind of as Tracy was saying, like some activity that they've been doing, but I agree. I don't know how to necessarily assess that, but I, I just don't know that, you know, a one day bar exam matters unless we notice, yeah, we need to really up our consumer protection here because we're seeing a lot more mm -hmm. discipline issues with attorneys from other states. So I'd like to answer actually both pieces of that, Emily, because I think we have, um, I think, I think we, we're not going to have data because we have we don't know what would be the case if we admitted out-of-state attorneys without going through the bar exam, right? All we have is the bar exam, those who've, who have had to take a bar exam as our, um, as, as our comparison, right? It's sort of the same argument that, that we uh, get with, you know, well, if we lowered the cut score, um, you know, is there going to be a, an increase in, in misconduct? And there's there right there. You can make all the assumptions you want, but we're we're never actually going to have that data until until we take that step. Um, the other the other thing that I I um, so, so I think we just we need to just figure it out and make guesses and 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 make assumptions um, based on experience that folks have had, like Judge Reeser has been explaining sort of his experience as some out of state attorneys. Um, but we're we're but we're not going to have data that's going to sway you one way or the other. I don't think. Um, with regard to the attorneys who have been, you know, whether they've been quote unquote, you know, actively practicing, um, we also need to remember that 
Um, so I've been an attorney for 27 years. Um, I have never set foot in a courtroom and, but I, I've remained on active status. I could theoretically walk into a courtroom in California tomorrow. I would much rather have any other out of state attorney than me walking into a courtroom. So, um, so we do, but, but it is, it is allowed, right? Obviously I would have under the rules of professional competence. I need to, I have a duty of, of competence. Um, as would an out-of-state attorney who we admit without, with or without taking a bar exam. So I do, I do worry about creating artificial barriers about what it means to have actively practiced um, within X number of years, because they're going to be subject to the same rules of professional competence that uh, rules of professional conduct that I am, and so it seems you know like. We should we should be asking ourselves, well, isn't that enough? Do we do we need to require them to have to demonstrate some level of active practicing before stepping in a courtroom? Then I would have to demonstrate. Thank you. That is very, very helpful and very good perspectives. Um, I guess the other question I have is how does this help us if we need to have it help us get our own attorneys to actually have reciprocity with another state? So if we said yes, we're going to just have a five-year minimum or whatever the year is that we say, and you, you know, moral character, all the things, but we're just not going to have attorneys do this exam anymore. Is that a negotiating tool that Leah or you or somebody can take to other states and say, hey, this is what we're doing. You know, we want our California folks to be able to sort of wave into yours as well, or is that even really an issue that we should be considering? I think we obviously can't speak for what other states would do. Um, that's certainly a discussion that that we should have um, with with other states, right? As we are identifying what our um, you know what our pathways look like, and um, and what we would you know what, you know what we would welcome from them. But one of the things that we have to understand is. Um, you know, especially if we're using the word reciprocity, right? The the assumption is um, that we're going to also be um, that, right? So we'll grant status to your attorneys if you grant status to to our attorneys, mm -hmm. and so um, and so um, you know we need to we need to make sure um, you know where what where we're comfortable granting status to our attorneys if you know, if they are not comfortable granting the same status, right, to, to, to California licensed attorneys. Um, one of the, right, one of the places that we've had some difficulty in the past um, is um, California having, uh, in addition to ABA approved law schools, we have our California registered law schools, our California accredited law schools, and our registered law schools, and there has been less willingness to, um, for other, in other states to um, to allow them into the practice. Um, and so I think we need to understand sort of what we would be willing to do. We'll let everyone from your state in, even if you only let some people from our state in, um, just we need to sort of figure out where the, the boundaries are that we're comfortable with that. Jackie? Yeah, so I, I, I think I want to reorient the conversation because I, I felt like that reciprocity piece may have gotten us a little bit off of, because it seems that, that our focus is what does the State Bar of California need to do to ensure that the public is protected, which may be different from what the State Bar of Idaho determines is necessary to protect their public. So. I'm curious, since we have, at least during this conversation, identified um, supervision under a California licensed attorney who meets certain parameters as a way to, uh, at least for new law school graduates, to ensure a minimum competence as it relates to California practice, would it make sense to have a much more limited supervised practice for out-of-state attorneys before they're 
fully licensed within the state of California. So um, Vermont had a similar provision years ago before it adopted the UBE, where it didn't matter how long you had practiced in another state, you needed to have so many hours of supervised practice uh, with a Vermont attorney um, prior to licensure, full licensure. And, um, but you still had the ability to, to be in court and et cetera. So do we want to consider, because um, it seems to me there's, there's hey, just come in and, and you can be licensed if you meet certain um, requirements regarding your previous practice or, hey, California uh, wants to make sure that you're ready to practice within our state and here's what you need to do in our state other than perhaps sitting for an, uh, a bar exam. So Jackie, just to um, follow up on that um, suggestion. So for example, uh, when uh, I brought up um, the, in the um, uh, multiple jurisdictional practice uh, categories, whether it's registered in-house counsel, legal aid attorney, or military spouse, um, in theory then after a while, each of those categories would qualify for full licensure. Um, I, I would say I don't know because I'd wanna know are there particular supervisors, ones that were vetted by the state bar and met the particular requirements? Are there any particular things that they need to establish or be able to do? in order to be deemed competent to practice in the state of California. So I don't know that it's it's an automatic, I've done this and therefore I'm now licensed or whether it would require a broader scope of immersion in California practice before we feel comfortable. And it's just uh, an idea of an alternative pathway, much like for our law school grads, but that is, is perhaps um, less onerous, but still provides some level of oversight and protection for the public here in California. Mm -hmm. um, Amy, I'm going to go back to trying to, um, there, there's, there's a lot of um, different options that are being discussed. I think the question for us is what is, um, what do we consider within our mission and, and where do we want to um, opine? I mean, one of the issues here is um, uh, the easiest one to start with is just out-of-state attorneys that we're talking about and whether or not they a, need to continue to take an exam as, as it exists today. Um, I think it was Emily that said it. I, I think I have the same assumption that that exam will be um, tailored to some of the changes that we're recommending, well, could be tailored to some of the changes that we're recommending on the exam generally, um, mm -hmm. that they would be CAPA specific, uh, et cetera, even in the, in the one day. Um, uh, and, and if that's the case, then, then that's probably something we would want to add to our recommendation, make sure the exam is um, uh, consistent. Uh, and then number two is, you know, do we need an exam for the out-of-state um, and, 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 or does exam look different? Or I think somebody brought it up, is there a supervised practice instead of exam uh, for out-of-state with a certain number of years and, and can make it through the other? I think um, that's probably a, a, an issue that we, is worth our time um and discussing some of the other pieces around reciprocity they're um, interesting and i would be um, willing to um, discuss a generalized statement about the importance of reciprocity i think i share um the goal that that the um uh, it's becoming more and more important to be able to practice um uh, between and among states um but i don't but i don't think that that's something that we um really are going to be able to opine on that's something that the bars uh, going to have to try to have a conversation and negotiate with other states if that's um, a possibility. And Josh, maybe if, if yeah. it's just a, like you just said, an encouragement in our recommendations, but not our focus at all. I think I think that's probably. Um, I mean, at some point here, I, I think we need to we need to focus on what we have, what's most important. Um, and I do think that if, if reciprocity, we all agree is important, then we should make a statement in our, in our recommendation um, that, um, that allows the court uh, and um, the bar to um, spend time on it uh, and try to, to try to solve it to some extent. I know it's been a difficult issue for California for many different reasons, including the multiple law schools 
uh, that Donna pointed out earlier. Um, does that scope that I laid out um, on, on these issues, does that make sense to folks? Are there other issues that they, they wanna be, um, make sure that we, we cover? If not, um, then let's just focus for a minute on um, the out-of-state uh, uh, test portion um, that we started to talk about. I kind of heard three different options. I think I heard um, the judge talk about um, his experience with maybe not needing the test in some cases. Um, we, we heard about folks that um, thought that maybe supervised um, uh, instead of the test. And then I think there are, were some comments about uh, the necessity of keeping the test because of um, just different backgrounds of folks coming in, but tailoring it to more uh, specifically to the recommendations on the um, bar exam that we're, uh, that we're gonna put forward. Um, is, that, is that kind of what I heard uh, comments on that, Emily? I would maybe just throw one more out that, and not to complicate it, and maybe it's not worth it, but a, a, a sponsorship. So the way that we, you know, you you can apply to a court or something is that you have an attorney that sponsors you, and maybe there is that that un, un, instead of supervised practice, having somebody that would basically be your sponsor and with the state bar would sign something saying, "Yes, I know this person. I'm familiar with their work," and you know, so it's just an option. Uh, Amy, is it possible um, to put a little bit of color around each of those options for our next meeting? Yes, uh, we can look at um, all of those four options and um, and try to flesh this out um, um, so we can uh, maybe uh, draft something that might um, look like a motion at some point. But uh, the idea is to um, uh, just look at how this fits in into what we have now or what we can have that addresses each of the points that uh, people brought in, ensuring that we recognize like uh, the experience and then also um, the um, requirements for each of these options. Yeah, as an example, there's another state um, that uh, does a supervised practice um, and, and not just an exam, I don't know if it exists, but we, we might wanna hear a little bit about that program. Okay. Um, that would be useful. Okay, we can do that. Um, the only other one in that in that group um, of, that you uh, walked us through that I think maybe just worth a discussion is foreign, um, and I'm not sure that we're um, ready to um, uh, to really dig into that. Are are uh, are there um, decision points that you think we should be considering around uh, ch any changes? Um, no, I mean, um, I, I just want to be clear that uh, there's a distinction between um, the distinction that uh, we make uh, in our applications is uh, foreign educated attorneys, those that have been practicing versus foreign educated uh, applicants, that is somebody who has a JD but never practiced. Um, those, there are two separate sets of requirements. Um, and uh, as with all of our categories, everybody's required to sit for the bar exam. But in that distinction, so um, one is um, apply it, the foreign attorney, somebody who's practiced in another jurisdiction in their home jurisdiction, is allowed to sit for the bar exam and um, you know, simply with uh, that certificate of good standing from their home jurisdiction. Those that are foreign educated must have uh, and have not practiced mm -hmm. uh, must uh, we must assess their um, evaluate their mm -hmm. degree to make sure it's uh, it, it matches a JD it's equivalent to a JD here. But they also require because they haven't practiced extra ed more education. So uh, LLM or uh, twenty semester units of an LLM program. And so um, I just want to put that out there um, and just uh, initially, like if anybody has any thoughts about um, those requirements, uh, do they appear to be too rigorous, um, too lenient? Um, what should change about them, if anything? Um, Judge Reiser, you have a comment or question? I, I, I do, because, you know, when we're talking about other states, you know, it's, it's fairly um, palpable, right? When we're talking about other countries, you know, it, it's never going to be one size fits all because there's a hundred and I don't know, less than 200, but more than 150 countries, right? So, so I think, I mean, just logically, it seems that let's figure out what we want to do with out-of-state attorneys and then 
and then make an assessment as to whether that ought to extend out to Canadian provinces, whether we ought to have separate rules for common law. You know, I, I don't know the answer to that. And I and I don't know even if within common law countries if one size fits all, right? I, I, I've I've seen uh, attorneys educated in Ireland and the UK who had to sit for the California um, bar exam. They passed it. It was, but it was you know, again, it was punishment, right? So so I don't know. Um, I, I I think we have to do it incrementally, right? Because unless we know what breadth we're allowing, um, non you know, other uh, U.S. residents' uh, access, it's going to be hard to assess what non-residents would be allowed. Okay. Neil? Yeah, um, from one more variable I'd like to throw into the mix here is the question of whether or not California is different. Uh, is its laws more complex? Does it have a more complex regulatory system? Does it have a more complex state constitution? And whether that, the answers to those questions have some relevance to what we're trying to come up here up with here, so. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, Karen? Yeah, thank you. And I, I... It's a really fascinating conversation. It, it occurs to me that one thing that might be helpful as a next step is for us to think about what we're trying to achieve with this category of questions and sort of what our operating principles are so that, so for instance, some level of parity and confidence that their education is on a par, right? Some level of confidence that if they have been practicing that we can evaluate that within the range of I mean, is this sort of what, what are the principles or, or are we trying to solve the reciprocity question or are we trying to solve the access question? Because I could see us getting very tangled up if we do this completely piecemeal by category and sort of coming up with very conflicting um, outcomes if we're not really grounded in what we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Right, which I assume is not punitive, but does at this the way we're doing it now may feel that way. So, so you know, how, how are what are we what are we revolving around as our core principles as we think about these questions? Okay, so um, one of the things that we could prepare um, for our next meeting is I think bringing back like the mission statement that we put mm -hmm. together early on as a group as well as are the questions that um, were directed to us from the uh, court in terms of um, recommendations for both the exam and the non-exam pathway vis-a-vis uh, -vis the out-of-state and out-of-country attorney so that it, we can get really focused on um, on that, making sure that or it ties to the values that we developed when we first started. Oh, Karen, you're on mute. And how that specifically ties perhaps in different ways than it would to a recent graduate from a California law school to the kinds of challenges we're seeing mm -hmm. in the way we're doing it now. Okay. Thank you. Judge Reiser. So, so Neil's question is really fascinating, right? And, and the CAPA committee spent a, a very substantial period of time figuring out if California is special and what is it about our exam? Should, should there be um, synchronicity with the uniform bar, et cetera? And ultimately what CAPA did was it got rid of trust in estates and it got rid of um, community property, which is you know more California specific than most topics. And it added administrative law, which is pretty much an interstate uh, you know, other than California admin, which is probably very um, similar to other states. So, so, so in that, in those Kappa meetings, my conclusion was California isn't that special, but there are things that we do in California that aren't as pervasive in other states. Like the, there's a very heavy employment law sector in California. There's an IP sector in California. There are things that are uh, disciplines that are more frequent entertainment. There's disciplines that are more frequently practiced in California, but I'm not sure Kappa concluded that California is special.
Well, I mean, I mean, the purpose I think for this was to get us a little bit of focus um, around these issues. We were clearly we were focused on um, uh, the exam for a good portion of this uh, commission's time on potential non-exam pathways um, that we've been narrowing um, some of the, the characteristics of and, and discussed earlier. And we've kind of kicked the can a little bit on some of the periphery, um, and some of the other issues out of state um admission foreign admission reciprocity um and so hopefully from this <clears throat> we can prepare some materials for the next meeting that'll get us um a little more focused on some of the gating questions um some of the issues that we got to grapple with and whether or not we want to attack those in in our recommendations or not is is, is there anything else, Amy, that we could uh, provide in this conversation or Donna that would help with um, that kind of focus? I can't think of anything. I'm just looking at my notes. I think um, we have a sense of um, what we need to bring back. Um, you know, what, what the different models are that the group is um, uh, considering, um, you know, in terms of the out of state attorneys. And then eventually for the out of country attorney. So I think we have some direction here that we can work off of. Um, uh, Jeremy, it looks like Jeremy has uh, yeah. some additional comments. Hey, Josh, just really quick, I just wanted to highlight your point earlier uh, about the exam. And if we do an out of state exam uh, for an out of state attorney or for foreign attorneys, um, that we would provide some sort of, I don't know if we have data or any information we can with regard to if we continue to offer that test. Um, what that might look like. Are we going to change it to make it, um, you know, uh, more applicable to sort of out-of-state attorneys or inter international attorneys? So if we're going to be changing the bar exam, I think to your, I think the point that you made, I hope this was the point that you made, or if I'm re recollecting it uh, correctly, but just that we would have, uh, that we would also be changing um, that exam as well. So it would, it would be sort of uh, all-encompassing. So Thanks, Josh. Neil? Just a quick thing about Judge uh, Reeser's comment about Kappa. I was also on Kappa too. I don't recall Kappa ever doing any relative measurement of the difficulty of laws across the various jurisdictions. I do recall Kappa comparing its results to what the NCBE did in terms of its practice analysis, but I could be wrong. Um, maybe there, it's somewhere in the Kappa report, but that's not my recollection. Well, Josh, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm sorry. Judge, it looks like you had a comment. Judge, you're on mute. Um, Neil is absolutely correct. There, there was no specific CAPA determination. And, and as to Neil's point, he, that's correct. California laws, California legislature is a full-time legislature, right? They're always in session. Uh, there are other states where it's a part-time job and they show up, you know, a couple of weeks a year and they and they they pass laws. So So absolutely, California laws are more intricate uh the question is um probably uh when we're looking at admission to the bar is it is, is the breadth and depth of california law relevant to a the skill set required of an, a beginning attorney i think um because yes neil's correct california laws are much more expansive than other states Okay, um, Amy, I think we have what we need out of this. Um, so unless there's um, additional um, topics or comments, I think for next steps, um, we will uh, reconvene in August when we do, I think it's August 16th, please someone correct me if I have the wrong date. Um, when we do, uh, we are going to cover um, non-exam pathway, uh, we're going to, we'll, we'll do so with a, um, we will put together kind of a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet that I think David asked for, um, with a couple of the different options and work towards a resolution. We'll look for a presentation from, um, Amy on, um, reciprocity on Addis, what other states are doing, um, to try to answer this question. Um, and then, um, uh, 
I think those are the two main topics we'll cover on the next meeting. Uh, Emily, comments? Yeah, I just have a question. We've gotten a lot of um, letters from those that are doing the PLL um, program. And I just wondered, are, are, is that something that we should be looking at separately from all of this? Or are they sort of waiting on our recommendation generally? I'm just kind of wondering how to, how to frame that for myself. Um, Donna, you're probably the best at uh, framing that. Yeah, um, great question. Um, so um, we are, um, so that, so no, I would not recommend a sort of necessarily a specific recommendation as relates to PLLs. We're looking for a recommendation from this group as relates to sort of future pathways to admission. Um, what we, what we will be doing, um, announced first here, um, we will be conducting some um, focus groups um, for supervisors, um, uh, uh, supervisors of uh, provisionally licensed lawyers, um, focus groups for um, pro probably three separate focus groups, one for supervisors, one for those who are in or have been in the original uh, pr provisional licensure program, the one that did not have a pathway, um, to admission and uh, those, and then the third for people who are are in or have been in the program that did offer a um, pathway to admission. Um, those focus groups will be followed up by surveys of um, those those populations to get more information um, that could ultimately help inform what the um, how the court may may want to shape some of the. Um, recommendations that come out of this group. Um, my hope is that we can conduct the focus groups in um, August um, and then launch the surveys probably uh, if all goes incredibly smoothly. Um, you know, uh, first week in September, maybe second week in September. Um, so it'll take a little while to get the results back, but we will have information Ultimately, by the time the recommendations of this group go to the Board of Trustees and the court, um, uh, we'll have information from those surveys that might help um, further refine some of the recommendations. Donna, I got I to gotta just jump in because you're, you're using the pronoun we, and I just want to be very clear. We is not this commission. We is the State Bar of California who's doing that. Um, yes. uh, this commission has a, um, a timeline and a goal. Um, and to the extent that the state bar gathers the information that Donna is um, discussing and that that can influence uh, the court or the board of trustees in their determination, um, they'll use that. Yes, absolutely correct. I, I, I thank you for the clarification and apologize. Uh, Mylin? Um, we're, we're okay on time for this meeting, right, Josh? Yes. If I could ask a sort yes. of high level question which, um, or, Two preliminary questions. One is whether um, do are we on track on our our commission timeline? Second question is, um, does anyone know is Next Gen still on track with their timeline? Which, as I understood it, was to they, they were going to be ready to administer their exam twenty twenty six. And as far as I know, they're still on. Um, on track on their timeline, which obviously, or I think obviously very much impacts what happens to California, if I'm not mistaken. I can't uh, address the next gen, maybe uh, somebody else will. It looks like David's shaking his head on that. Uh, I will address the other issue, which is our timing first. Um, we are uh, in the next meeting, um, August, September kind of timeframe, we're gonna really move towards making recommendations so that we um, can have staff uh, prepare um, a, a report around it and that we can um, try to get that to um, the trustees uh, of the state bar before the end of the year or, year or January at the latest. And then ultimately, whatever it is that California is going to have in place gets rolled out when? Yeah, we we don't we don't know, right? Part of it depends on what gets adopted, and then um, and then the process for developing the the specificity um, in, in right what gets adopted. So 
right? If the if the court says, yes, I 100% agree with everything that this Blue Ribbon Commission said about um, about a what an exam what an exam pathway would look like, right? Uh, then um, then we've got to go and work with test developers, and um, so everything's going to take um, take a few years, I think, to to pull together. Sorry to require so much handholding, but am I correct that we need to roll out what we are going to have? We California are going to have by twenty twenty six because in twenty twenty six any part of the, we're gonna lose the MBE questions, right? Because it's gonna be something different. So we're gonna to have to, at a minimum, replace those. So David might have a, an update. The last we had heard from NCBE that they were looking into whether they would have sort of a few years of sort of the ability to give give folks the MBE for a little bit longer um, after they rolled out next gen. There are certainly other um, other things that we are exploring as well um, with that with that very date in mind. Okay, and then the last, and I'm sorry to take up so much time, my last is just an observation um, that as I recall, we were from the exam pathway subcommittee, the idea was to, to develop our own exam, but also keep an eye um, an eye on next gen, the UB, right? And to the extent that that is even anywhere within the possibility um, for California, we are one year away from welcoming the entering law school class that will be impacted by that 2026 bar exam. I'm going to I'm going to call on David because he looks like he has some comments on this. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, confirm my understanding that NCBE will continue to uh, offer uh, an MBE for some reasonable period of time after the uh, after the transition to next gen. I don't know exactly how long, but it, it there will be a, a formal transition period when the MBE will continue to be available. Thank you. Jackie? This just goes back to what Donna mentioned about the kind of um, work that they're going to be doing to study the PLL. And because I, like Neil, found the survey information on the Ontario piece so helpful, um, I'm wondering, <coughs> excuse me, are you looking um, also at, at perhaps surveying judges or to the extent it's possible and appropriate any of the consumers that were served by those in the PLL? Uh, we will certainly take that into consideration, and we we did get the underlying questions um, that were asked in uh, Ontario, um, uh, and so we'll sort of take a look and sort of whatever whatever we can sort of pull off, um, we will we we will do. Alex, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the commission received a letter from a coalition of 17 bar associations and defense council um, seeking what they call sort of a long enough period for them to comment on, on our approach. Um, what is the intent um, in terms of our response to that request? Um, uh, Don, I don't know if you uh, want to address that specifically. I mean, I can tell you, Alex, I, I um, I do believe that there is, as you can tell, a number of months that we're still deliberating. So we would be very open to their comments during that period of time by letter or in, in, in person. Um, uh, uh, we have obviously um, a public comment um, before every meeting. Um, I know that everybody's received the letter. Um, I have read it, understand it, and, and um, I think there's some uh, good points in there. Um, that being said, I'm not sure that the bar has a, uh, a specific response or um, at this point or that the commission is considering a formal response of any kind. Um, I do think um, more comment uh, from stakeholders is important. 
Um, and we are starting to, it, it was, it was kind of hard in the beginning, I think, to comment because we were um, really grappling with very wide ranging issues, but we're narrowing. And so to the extent that there are specific comments around the, that, that narrowing, um, those will be useful and um, we'll look for them. Uh, Leah? Yeah, I just was, I was going to say that one thing that I think we need to do uh, in terms of staff support of this commission is get materials posted, get them posted in advance and have some corresponding memos that outline uh, the deliberations, um, because I think that will facilitate the kind of uh, comment, feedback, and engagement that that letter reflects, I think, is missing. Because I agree it was a helpful letter, but I do think that the group has talked about many of those issues. Um, so I, I think if we did a bit better of a job of laying that out publicly and in advance of the meetings, it might assuage um, some concerns. And then in terms of overall public comment, I, I don't know, and maybe uh, Donna, Amy, or Audrey know better what we've talked about uh, or they've talked about in terms of when the official public comment would sort of launch for the full set of recommendations. It may be after the uh, recommendations go to the board uh, in September and prior to then submitting it to the Supreme Court. With some bodies like this, we've done public comment uh, earlier. I, I don't know if the timeline for this group would accommodate that, but I do want to assure everybody there will be a full uh, comment period, and I'm quite certain that the court would want to have the benefit of that public comment when we do submit the recommendations to the court. Thank you. Um, maybe um, at our next meeting, we can lay out what the uh, most advantageous timing is for that um, between uh, our recommendation versus uh, after the trustees uh, have had an opportunity to review it. Um, David, you still have your hand up. Uh, another question, you good? Okay, um, I think that the that wraps up and concludes the topics for today. Um, uh, Donna or Amy, um, Leah, Audrey, anything else uh, we need to cover? Um, no, uh, I just want to also confirm what you had asked earlier. The meeting, yes, our next meeting is August sixteenth. Okay, great. Um, okay. Um, Thank you everyone for the time and effort. I know that this is um, uh, sometimes a little long and arduous, but very much appreciated. Um, we will get materials uh, prepared for the next meeting. Um, and thanks for the time. That concludes the meeting for today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.